What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Scripted Kingdom. My name is Pharaoh, and thank you for tuning in as I tune the fuck in, bitch. Hello! Woo! We are here today, as you see by the title of this podcast, to talk about Disney Channel, bitch. I know that's the fuck right. <laughs> I know that's the fuck right. It's Halloween season. Happy Halloween. And I'm here to get into the Halloween spirit. So... What happened was, when I was thinking of the idea of this video, I was like, I want to do a top 10 Halloween movies or a top 10 horror movies or something along those lines. If you don't know, I'll tell you right now, one of the reasons I made this podcast is because I need to get into more movies. I would love movies. I want to be more involved with movies. So I'm doing this as a way for me to... Damn. I'm doing this as a way for me to get into that. But as of now, I'm still movie inhibited. I'm still movie unaware. I'm still movie unexperienced. So I don't have a good ass list. When I was thinking of the top 10 horror movies, I was like, okay, I love this. This is a cute idea. But it just it just felt like it wasn't in my heart. You know, <laughs> I was like, I was like, this is good as fuck. I could do a horror. Now the horror movie, it wasn't that bad. I could do the horror movie list because I do love some very niche horror movies here and there. But I just feel like I haven't even seen some of the big ones. I haven't even got into some of the lore of it all. Like, there's so much stuff that I could get into with horror movies. So I was like, damn, let me wait on that. And I was like, okay, I could just do Halloween movies. But even Halloween movies, I was like, well, shit. A lot of the horror Halloween movies, I haven't even d dived into. There's Halloween movies over here, over there. So I just didn't, I di it didn't feel right yet. Give me some time. This this podcast is going to be around for forever. So give me some time on that. But what I was ready to do was what we're going to be doing today. Growing up, I'm Gen Z. Yeah, young, bitch, youthful, bitch. But I'm <laughs> as a Gen Zer, I grew up on Disney Channel. And Disney Channel had a lot of Halloween movies growing up that you could get into or whatever. So what I decided to do was I actually went and I rewatched every single Halloween Disney movie or watched for the first time because they have some new ones for the Gen X. I guess it's the young Gen Zers. Ugh. So they have some new, <laughs> some new ones as well. And I went and I watched every single Halloween Disney movie, whether it came out in Halloween time halloween time of the year which most of them did and then there's some that didn't come out around halloween time but they're very clearly halloween themed and they play them around halloween time so i took all of those movies it ended up being 20 of them i rewatched all 20 and now i'm about to rank those movies here for you today bitch how exciting how fucking exciting so honestly let's just hop into the motherfucking ranking because it's 20 movies so let's get through them okay i know that's the fuck right now ooh, disclaimer bitch <laughs> disclaimer disclaimer some of some of the movies on this list from our childhood are bad movies you you remember them and you're like, oh, that's a hit. I love that movie. And then when you go back and watch, you're like, oh, this is actually not a good movie. And I'm going to just be very completely frank. I was trying to find a balance between my nostalgia for the movie, the impact the movie has had on other Halloween movies, other Disney movies, and then how good the movie itself actually is. And I had to really balance all of that. And then the whole time I have to remember this is kind of targeted towards kids so when you're younger it's definitely a different experience than watching it as older so there's a lot of things i had to take into account into this ranking i'm gonna let you know right now this ranking is very uh, give or take bitch like there's movies that can move around a little bit it was actually very hard to really rank them i'm not even gonna lie and then we'll get to it but some of the movies i feel like the movie themselves are better than a lot of these other movies but did the impact really eat does the nostalgia really eat for me? So it's a different, there's, there's layers that went into this, but you're just going to have to bear with me, bitch. But let's just hop into it. Let's hop into it for real. So the first movie I want to talk about, number 20 on the list is Can of Worms. Now, girl, I've heard about Can of Worms as a child growing up, but I had never seen this movie. And I know why I haven't seen this movie, because it's fucking trash. No shade. But every time I heard about it growing up, I always heard about it positively, I feel. I feel like I always felt like it was like, oh, this is an underrated classic that nobody has ever seen. So I was excited to watch it. And then I watched it and I was like, girl, I know why no one has ever seen it. And it's surprising because there's movies that came out before this, because this came out in 1999. 
Halloween Town came out in 1998. Um, there's other movies that came out in 1999 that I've seen from Disney Channel. And this one, I just haven't seen that much. It hasn't been played that much. And I think I know why, because it's not as good. It doesn't stand the test of time like Halloween Town. Halloween Town is played to this day, bitch. So I definitely see that the difference. No shade. So Can of Worms on IMDb got a 4.8 out of 10. It got a 42% on Rotten Tomatoes. And a lot of Disney Channel movies do get low ratings on these critical stores, which makes sense because no shade. A lot of them are not that good. <laughs> it's no shade. So I get why they're low. Honestly, this one should have been lower. 4.8 is too high because this shit was fucking trash, baby. Like, I, 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 I could not. I didn't even want to finish the movie and it's no shade. So if you haven't seen it, I would definitely suggest to just go ahead and continue to not have seen it for the rest of your life because you're not going to be gagging. Now, I will say going in, I wanted to like it going in. I wanted to enjoy it. And I was like interested in what it could what it could be because I had never seen it. I didn't even know what it was. And the beginning of the movie was actually really good, in my opinion. It's like about this character and the main character, the protagonist. He let me see what his name is. Mike. Mike, he's like this kind of a nerd and he feels like he's so different than everyone and he feels so different that he thinks he's an alien. And I could actually relate to that. Okay, hold on. I don't think I'm an alien, but I remember as a kid growing up and feeling like, okay, I'm so different. Maybe like I'm a mystical creature. Maybe like I'm a mermaid. It was just like something fun and imaginative to feel when you was a kid. And then like, sometimes it would feel like you really, really feel that, but really you didn't, but you really thought you did. And it just, it felt so relatable, especially if I was a kid watching this, this whole first part of this movie was super re relatable. So he felt that way. He felt like a nerd. He felt like did nobody really fuck with him. He had this crush at school. She kind of liked him back. He was surprised. And then he had this like carry moment where the bully set him up for the dance to where he got stuff sprayed all over him. He got embarrassed at the dance and then he went home and then the rest of the movie kind of started. And that part of the movie was actually tea, bitch. I was like, okay, this is good as fuck. Like I can relate to him. It's kind of showing like how it is for a kid to kind of have a like de not even depressed. I don't know if it's exactly depression, but he had a lot of anxiety. He had a lot of like sad feelings, like depressive feelings. Honestly, fuck it. Like it just felt like a kid who might have, you know, some of these mental disorders that we see and we realize when we're growing up, it seems like we could kind of see how that like translate to someone who's a kid. And I really did like that part of the movie. And then the movie really started. And the whole concept was, oh, he awoken the, these aliens from the planet that he uh, allegedly is from. And that's where it went downhill. It really did. Because that whole first part was good. And I felt like it was setting up a possibility for something good. But when the aliens come down, you find out that, that the aliens are just lawyers. Like, it's lawyer aliens trying to sign him so that they can represent him. Because he sent this signal out saying that he needed help. And it's like, that wasn't interesting. Like, even as an adult, that's not interesting. And as a kid, I'm thinking, how would it be interesting to me that, oh, these aliens are lawyers, other than how they look? Like, oh, they're pretty. But it's like, them being lawyers was stupid as fuck. And then it, all they wanted to do was represent him. By the last 10 minutes of the movie, his best friend's little brother gets taken to the other world. And the last 10 minutes is them going to the, to the alien world and trying to save him. That part was cute because they were in the alien world, but it was the last 10 minutes. I didn't even like care at that point. We had spent the entire bulk of the middle movie with random aliens popping up asking to be his lawyer. And that's literally it. And it's like, damn, you had a good setup. And then the ending was even cute. But the middle part, the entire bulk of the movie was stupid. And then by the time the movie's over, it's like, what the fuck was we even here for? I didn't even feel like he learned to not feel so excluded from the world. I didn't even feel like he learned that lesson. I feel like all the bully learned the lesson of not to exclude people, but he didn't even learn the lesson of you don't need to be asking for aliens to come down. Like that was supposed to be the whole point, but I didn't even get that energy from it. I don't know. It just became stupid. And then it seemed like they wanted to throw too many different shits in at the same time. This concept of him being bullied and, oh, my God, let's give this Carrie thing to this Disney movie. But then let's bring in these aliens. And we just want to bring as many aliens as possible. So let's just make them all lawyers trying to invite him. And then at the end, he's going to defeat the alien world. And it's like, uh, uh, I feel like 
two of the concepts were good. Them going to the alien world, that's fun and adventurous. Them staying at home and him being this carry type of victim, that's fun and adventurous. Well, not adventurous, but that's interesting to watch. And then the entire rest of the movie and the concept of the movie all just fell flat. It was all stupid as fuck. And then also, when I'm doing these ratings for these movies, I kind of want to get into how it makes me feel. Does it make me feel Halloween-y? Like, this is a Halloween ranking, bitch. Do not watch this shit on Halloween. Don't watch this shit ever. But even on Halloween, it doesn't give you that vibe. It doesn't give you that Halloween vibe. So I really had to put this last. It provides zero for for me. This was nothing. Trash. I would give this a 0.5 out of 10. The 0.5 coming from the beginning of the movie and really that's it because even the end of the movie was rushed and it was stupid as fuck. So the beginning part of the movie, it, 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 was, it was doing its big one. It was relatable. And then other than that, it was trash. 20. Next, number 19 on the list is Stepsister from Planet Weird. Now, Stepsister from Planet Weird, it got 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. That's very high. Calm down. 37% on Rotten Tomatoes. That makes more sense. Um, So it was higher on IMDb than Can of Worms, but lower on Rotten Tomatoes than Can of Worms. I would say, in my opinion, this is one step better than Can of Worms. It was a very consistent story from beginning to end, and there was no bullshit. So I'll give them that. But bored. Out of my mind, y'all. I've seen this movie before, which is funny. Because I went back and I wanted to do like a decom rewatch when I was a very younger kid, when I was like in middle school or something. And this was one of the ones I actually did watch on that rewatch. I missed some of them, like Can of Worms. But this one I did watch. And I remember falling the fuck asleep because that's what the fuck this is. The flow was a bore. Like, I'm bored as fuck. So let's get through the pros because it's not many. One of the pros was I did like the concept of the two daughters because what it is is it's this girl and her mama doesn't her mama and her daddy broke up and the mama gets with another man and he turns out to be an alien and then she has a stepsister and the stepsister is also an alien because that's her daddy's her mama's boyfriend's daughter now it sounds more interesting than it is because when you start watching it's boring as fuck the type of aliens they are are they're like bubbles they're like floating bubbles F floating bubble heads from a different world you don't really get to get into none of that tea she doesn't do much the alien sister or the alien dad they don't do much alien things they just drink soda and they act weird but that's it it's like they're not even giving alien they don't even seem to have ill intentions they're kind of just there and weird so the daughter doesn't want them to be there and then that's really it so she has to learn to work with her alien sister to like try to break up their parents because they don't want their parents to be together and then they stop doing that and then the parents stay together and that's it and it's like for me the plot falls flat it's not enough intensity to it i don't really feel i didn't i didn't feel anything and the main thing we're supposed to feel is like oh work together have a camaraderie don't judge people blah 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 blah. i'm not gagging it didn't it didn't get that point across at all it was not that interesting at all i hate it that these the both of these movies the one i just did kind of worms in this one the main interesting part didn't come to the last 15 minutes. I hate movies without an antagonist. And at the beginning of the movie, the antagonist is supposed to be the sister, like the alien sister. So I get it. That was working fine. She was like stealing all her friends at school. She was being this cool, popular kid while the main girl was a nerd. So she was jealous. That was actually cool and interesting. But then there was this bigger emperor from the alien world that was chasing the sister and her dad the whole movie but we didn't find out he was chasing them until the last 15 minutes of the movie and it's like y'all could have made this movie so much better if you just introduced from the beginning that they were running and he was chasing them this whole time it would have created a sense of urgency with the fact that they're being chased and now they're here on this world and her family is now in danger. The main character's family now in danger because this random man that her mama got with is being chased by an emperor of an alien race. And it's like, we didn't get that until the last 15 minutes. So all of that intense emotion that we could have got throughout the movie that made it more interesting, that would have picked up the pace, that would have made it more, you know, layered was lacking. And it's like, God damn, y'all are stupid as fuck. Because in like newer D Disney Channel movies, it, movies in general, what you'll see is you'll see what's happening in the calm, you know, the calm part of the movie, which is, oh, a stepsister just came. I'm mad about it. Mom, you're dating this man. He's probably an alien. And then it'll flash to the alien world where the emperor is like, we have to find them. Where are they at? Are they on Earth? Uh oh. And so now the viewer is like, uh oh, 
not only is this bitch an alien, he finna come kill all of you hoes. And then we're feeling, you know, intense, excited, all of that. But no, they didn't even tell us it was an emperor until the movie was fucking over and I was fucking asleep, falling asleep. So yes, I just, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. They just missed the mark. I think the idea was, was pitchable. I see why it got pitched. I see why it got picked up. It sounds cooler than what it was. It was actually very boring, lame, flat. And I'm not gagging. None of the characters were memorable. None of the characters made me feel that much at all. Um, it, it was supposed to be funny at times. It wasn't. It just, it was a no for me. I'm going to have to give this one a 0.5 out of 10 as well. Oh, 0.5 out of 5 stars as well. Uh, mm -mm. Wasn't doing it. Next, number 18 on the list. Ooh. <laughs> this might hit a few of you. This might hit a few of you. So hold your britches, bitch. Number 18 is Mom's Got a Date with the Vampire. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And you know what pisses me off about this one? Growing up, I used to always remember, ooh, some of these DCOMs that they don't play often, they're hits. Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire, My Date with the President's Daughter, that era of DCOMs, that, day, that era eight, that era eight. And I thought it did. To this day, I thought it did. I was going in on my rewatch when I was getting to Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire. I'm rewatching with my friends and I'm like, ooh, I can't wait till we get to that one because I know that one's good. Some of these other ones I've never seen or they were bad. This one, I knew this one was good. Why the fuck is this shit trash? I do not remember this movie being so not, not good. It actually pisses me off that it was not that good. So let's... <laughs> Let's get into this shit because it was not that good. So first of all, the pros are it does feel a little Halloweeny. The setting is always kind of nighttime. The vampire concept is always a little bit fun. Just the idea of vampires being involved. So both of, both of those things were were interesting. But that was it. Everything else was trash. I didn't like. First of all, y'all, if you thought you liked this movie and you've been saying it for years how this was a good Disney Channel movie. Go rewatch this as an adult. And I know I'm supposed to be putting myself in a kid mindset and a child mindset because this is targeted towards kids. And I do think as a kid, this would hold up better, but it's really just not good. And even as an adult, there's other movies that holds up better. So it's like you could have held up better because there's other movies that did it. It's just very, it's just very irrelevant of a movie. So first of all, it got 5.8 out of 10 on IMDb. And 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I think this has been the highest one. <sighs> it should have been lower than that, y'all. Sorry. It should have been lower than that. Because, yes, it's a cute concept. But the execution is terrible. I don't like that the mom going on the date with the vampire was set up by the kids. I thought, from my memory, I thought mom was falling in love with the vampire. She actually liked the vampire. And that was the thing that was so scary. It's like, oh, my God, she genuinely wants to get with him. No, she didn't even want to go on the date, y'all. The vampire asked her on the date and she was like, mm, I'm not gagging. He took her on the date. She's like, I'm not gagging. She didn't even seem interested the entire time she was dating the vampire. And it's like, that's less interesting to me as the viewer. I thought what we were scared of was the fact that she might actually stay with this vampire and fall in love. And uh oh. No, she didn't even give a fuck. She literally didn't even give a fuck. So it's like, now that I'm seeing that she didn't give a fuck, I feel less scared for her. I'm less even involved. I'm. It's less intense. So I feel like that was a misstep. Y'all should have made it to where the mom was interested in the vampire herself instead of the kids trying to force this upon her, her not giving a damn because it lacked urgency. It lacked intenseness. I didn't care. And then the vampire, all we saw the vampire do was turn into a bat, run fast, and walk up a wall. And it's like, as a kid, I feel like those moments were more intense. Like, ah, he's a vampire! But in reality, it's not shit. I needed to see him, like, do something scarier than that. And there's this moment in the movie where it's like, this is the perfect time to make it, to make it a horror, or not a horror movie because it's for children, but make it scary or make it intense. Because it's not even scary. Just make it intense. Because he gets thrown out of the bar by three of the barmen. 
So it's just the vampire and three barmen in the alley. And I'm expecting them to like show the vampire shadow of him extending his fangs ready to eat the barmen. And they don't even do that. They just have the barmen walk back in the, in, into the bar. And it's like, what? Show us something to where we feel more intense about the fact that this dude is a vampire. We never got anything. He never did anything bad. So it's like, he's not doing anything bad. The, one, the mom doesn't even want him. Why do I give a fuck? You know, like they really needed to throw in those moments where he was being more destructive. And this is a theme across a lot of these movies, these Halloween movies with Disney Channel. They're afraid to kind of get a little bit destructive or, or scary or stuff like that. And I know it's because another one of their movies that came out, I think a year before this one, got some backlash because they were saying this is too scary for Disney Channel to be targeted towards young kids. So they pulled back. They stopped showing that movie on TV and they kind of changed the the way they did it. But I think they should have just ignored the backlash, honestly, because or they should have found a happy medium. I think they went too far in the direction of we can't show anything. And it's like, no, don't not show anything. Just don't make it super scary. All you had to do was show that the shadow of the man fangs. Like, that's fine. It's okay. So I just feel like they took too far of a step back. And so it made this movie fall super, super flat. There was no intenseness, nothing. And then there's a random fucking vampire hunter. First of all, don't remember him. Second of all, stupid as fuck. Because he's so uninvolved with the rest of what's going on. The two kids are trying to help the mom and chase the mom and then all of this other stuff. And then the youngest kid is stumbled upon by this vampire hunter. And the vampire hunter starts driving the youngest kid around. He's walking up in the house. The only one there is the seven-year-old kid. It's like, first of all, uh, this is not standing the test of time. Why is he with this little kid, this random man? And then he doesn't matter to the story. He's so irrelevant to the story. He's nobody's friend. He's nobody's uncle, nothing. And it's like, what they should have done is the vampire should have been the mom's ex because the mom, she recently divorced her husband and now she's found, she fell in love with this vampire. If the husband was the vampire hunter, the ex-husband, it would have made way more sense for him to be involved. He would have been way more important to the story. And then the whole dating part would have been more relevant because it's like you have an ex-husband who you could end up getting back with. It would have made the entire story more endearing. It would have wrapped everything together. But with him being a random man who the mom doesn't know and none of the kids know and none of us know, and he's not even interacting with any of the people in the story because he keeps missing them trying to find the vampire, he becomes irrelevant. And now I'm just watching this irrelevant man drive this little kid around. Like, what? So stupid as fuck. They d and there was easy things they could have did to make this movie good, and they didn't do it, so it pissed me off. So, mm -mm. this was also really 0.5 stars out of out of five. Like, I cannot do it. The concept was cute, and you know, I'll give it one out of five stars because of the nostalgia it had for me. That's why it's above those other two movies. I had nostalgia for it, so it was good at one point. It does feel way more Halloween-y than the other two, and the concept is a little bit more fun than the other two. And I just feel like if it was executed properly, this could have been a top 10, top five movie on the list. It just was executed very poorly. And I feel like they could have did better. So let's go to the next one. Number 17 on the list is Invisible Sister. Now, if you are um, Gen Z from, from the, 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 the cusp of Gen Z and millennials like me, if you're one of the, the older Gen Zers, you don't know what the fuck this is. Because I didn't know what the fuck this was. Invisible Sister came out in 2015. Girl, I was grown. Well, not grown, but grown as fuck. Like, I didn't know what the fuck this was. Mm -mm. But Invisible Sister, I watched it. Because I was like, shit, if I'm going to do it, I need to watch all of them, even the new ones. And let me tell y'all something about these newer, newer movies. These newer movies are not that bad. Honestly, this one, not that good, I will say. But... As a movie itself, a standalone movie on its own, I would say this one up from this 17 up, these all work as standalone movies. It just comes down to preference or if the movie itself is actually interesting to me or good or necessary. I think this was a this was a movie that stands alone fine. I think one of the main issues about this movie is that it's promoted as a Halloween movie and it's not Halloweeny. And that shit pisses me off. I hate when <laughs> when they do Halloween movies just to do them and they're not actually Halloweeny. 
There was like no scene in this movie that made me feel like the Halloween spirit. And when you get to the top movies on this list, it's all the ones that make me feel the Halloween spirit. I love that part of Halloween movies. And it's like, why would you make a Halloween movie or target it as Halloween? And it have nothing to do with Halloween. All that, all the only thing that was relevant to Halloween on this movie is that it was set on Halloween. And you wouldn't even, you would not have been able to tell. I thought it was summertime, bitch. I genuinely thought it was summertime. It was like one scene where they were in a cemetery. So that scene was, was more Halloween-y. But that was like one scene. And it was at the end of the movie. Everything else, it was daytime. They were in school. It was all happy. Like, it was no Halloween energy, no Halloween intensity, nothing. It was really just the day. Like, it, it, bitch, a random day in September, bitch. You would never be able to tell. And I did not like that. That was a immediate con for me. And it put it below a lot of different movies. So let me see. Invisible Sister, 5.9 out of 10 on IMDb. So the highest IMDb rating so far. And 58% on Rotten Tomatoes. Look, that's too high. Once again, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's too high. Honestly, that that one's, this movie isn't ba a bad movie. So I'm not mad. I would still say it's like a five out of ten at most. Like this was, this was a this was a no for me. So, anyways, some of the pros I liked about this movie, I did like the concept. The concept was fun. It kind of reminded me of like a Freaky Friday type of concept. Concept. It's like the sisters weren't getting along, and she accidentally turned her sister invisible, and now they have to figure out to get a, how to get along. This is the issue. They didn't execute it right because the sisters weren't not getting along. And, and that's the thing. It's like the concept that would have made this good is that the sisters were literally arguing and bickering and fighting. That's not what was happening. The younger sister was a little bit jealous of the older sister because she felt like the older sister was popular and pretty and she was. That was it. If they would have had them fighting, arguing, beefing over that, and then we got the rest of the movie... It would have made the movie 30 times better, like Freaky Friday. It's like there's certain things you have to do to make the concept you're going for work in a way that's going to be a 10 star movie. If you leave one part of the movie out or one part of the story out, or if you don't make one part of the story intense enough, it can change the movie from a 10 star movie to a two star movie. And that's what happened. If they would have started this movie out and these girls were beefing, and then the older sister accidentally got turned invisible, and then they had to figure out how to get her back, that would have made this movie so much better. Instead, it's like, you can barely tell that Rowan Blanchard, the, the main character, is hating on the sister. You can't even really tell because she's being so amb ambiguous about it. And then whenever the situation happens, it's like, oh, okay, they're just cool sisters. They're cool with each other. They don't have to figure out how to work together. There's no conflict in them working to together. They work so smoothly together to get this solution solved. It's like there was never a point that I didn't think she wasn't going to come back to life. Like, I always knew they were going to get it done because they were always working together so lockstep. Like, they were very, you know, cool with each other. And that's a negative because it lacks intensity. It lacks conflict. There was, like, very little conflict in this movie other than the fact that the girl was invisible. And I didn't care because I didn't even care enough about the older sister before the older sister turned invisible. We got so much Rowan Blanchard, zero older sister, and now the older sister is invisible, and I don't give a damn because I don't know her. I also didn't like how isolated the sisters were throughout the movie. I wish um, Karan Barar, which is the best friend of the main character, I wish he would have been more involved in the invisibleness earlier. It was like the sister's boyfriend and Karan Barar did not get involved until the very end of the movie. It's like five, it was like three or four secondary characters who were friends with them and they weren't even aware of the situation until the very end of the movie and it's like if some of them were involved throughout the movie it would have made the like lineup of people who were watching more fun it would have expanded what they could have done with this it could have been more interesting they could have had like karam barar helping them hide and do something stuff like stuff like that makes it more interesting when you involve more people in the situation and because it was only two people involved for 90% of the story, it's like boring. And it's like, oh, it's just them two. 
they'll figure it out who gives a damn so yeah it's just not many thoughts i feel like they they did a good job for telling for to tell a story from beginning to middle to end and it was a cute fun idea but it just wasn't executed well and it didn't eat and it what it's not touching a lot of these other movies so had to give it 17 now these next two i'll just go ahead and do them together number 16 and number 15 zombies 2 and zombies 3 I have Zombies 2 at 16, Zombies 3 at 15. To be frank, I didn't need either of these movies. And you know what? Hot take. I don't even hate zombies. You see, I ain't said it yet. I don't even hate zombies. So it's not that I hate zombies and that these are these new school movies. These two movies are just super, super, super unnecessary. Everything does not need a sequel. And Zombies 2 and Zombies 3 are evidence of that. I did not need a sequel of Zombies. And I definitely didn't need two sequels of Zombies. Zombies 2 is lower because it is literally the exact same concept of Zombies 1, but with werewolves. And that is lazy as fuck. And I do like the concept of Zombies, which I'll get into with Zombies. But doing it twice in a row actually pisses me the fuck off. And they barely tweaked anything about it. Like, it's de- it's literally the same concept. It's literally the same concept. It's just differently done and barely differently. The werewolves aren't compelling to me. The songs were mid as fuck. I didn't fuck with the songs. And it started to become a lot of different characters that I didn't care about. I felt like they the plot was falling flat. I could barely even understand where the plot was going. It was the same as the other one, but also they were trying to throw in this cheerleading, running for president. Um, Zed, the main character, the zombie, was running for president. Addison was a cheerleader, and she was doing her cheerleader shit. And it's like, they're focusing on that, and the werewolves are doing a bunch of shit. They didn't get involved with the werewolves until, like, the middle of the movie, and it didn't really matter by that point. I definitely didn't give a damn. So it just was a no. Oh, for Invisible Sister. Did I give Invisible Sister a star? I don't remember. I, I'm going to give Invisible Sister 1.5 out of 5 stars for sure. And then for Zombies 2, I have to give Zombies 2 1.5 out of 5 stars as well. And I have to give Zombies 3 1.5 out of 5 stars as well. I think Zombies 3 has a slightly better concept. The aliens coming down was interesting at first i thought it was going to be so fun but their goal finding the precious the most precious thing in the city that was fun and interesting and then they were like we're gonna join the cheerleading squad and we're gonna cheerlead and that's how we're gonna find it and it's like oh they just made it so much more boring by trying to ingratiate it into this world that we've had which is this cheerleader football world and that's what everything is about and it's like that makes everything so much more basic Like, I really wish they did not feel the need to ingratiate that in all of the sequels because that shit is stupid and boring. So because the aliens were now doing the cheerleading shit, their whole goal of finding the the precious thing, it kind of just went away. And they just went towards figuring out how to cheerlead. And that whole goal, it's not them being destructive. They're not rummaging through zombie, zombie town. They're not rummaging through the regular town. They're not doing shit because they're just ready to cheerlead. And it's like, that's fucking boring and lame as fuck. I have it above two, though, because the music was actually T. This was like my favorite music of the series was from this. Also, Zombies does not need to be a musical. It is so unnecessary. I'm going to get more into it when we talk about Zombies. But ugh. but the music on this one was actually good. But yeah, did we need this? No. Did we need number two? No. The main characters now at Zombies 3, there's... Four main characters from the first Zombies one. There's like four or six main characters from the first Zombies. There's like three main werewolf characters. And then they added three alien characters. So at this point, we have a fucking Grey's Anatomy all-star cast. Star-studded cast. Not even star-studded. But a Grey's anatomy size cast for this bum-ass movie. It was just a no for me. 1.5 out of 10. Let's move forward. I'm not going to stay on them for too long. Oh, let me see what their IMD ra- IMDb rating was, though. So Zombies 2 had a 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb and 100% on Rotten Tomatoes with five reviews. Rotten Tomatoes is so untrustworthy. Get the fuck out of here. Zombies 3 had a 5.4 out of 10 on IMDb. Damn, they had Zombies 3 worse and a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. Honestly, if you want Zombies 3 to be worse, that's fine with me as well because... The concept for Zombies 1 and Zombies 2, what it's implying is more important 
than what Zombies 3 was implying. So I wouldn't mind putting Zombies 2 above Zombies 3. I just didn't because it was a repeat of the first one and the music was trash. So there you go. Fuck Rotten Tomatoes is what I'm realizing. They just be fucking talking. The fuck they talking about? So anyways, number 14 on my list is... Ooh, a fun one. Under Wraps, the 2021 version. So, this was one I was excited to watch because Under Wraps, the OG version, was one of my favorite Disney Channel movies growing up. The nostalgia I have to that movie is is very strong. And that movie concept always made me feel super in the Halloween mood. And I love feeling in the Halloween mood with these Halloween movies, of course. Now, the issue with this one... Well, first of all, the pro with this one is it, it really is the same concept. They just try to expand here and there. But I think that kind of fucked them up. And we'll get into why the expanding probably kind of fucked them up. But one thing I did like about this one compared to the first one is the main storyline with Marshall, the main character, and his mom was super important to the story. And I remember watching the first one and being like, they could have told this better. They could have let us know that this was the main problem better. And in this movie, they did kind of better. But honestly, the rest of the movie just kind of got extended in a bad way that it still had had a bad taste in my mouth. But they did better at letting us know that Marshall and his mom had a conflict about this boyfriend she had. So I liked that part. I liked that they had Calling All the Monsters by China and McClain in this movie. They really needed to have that in one of these scary movies or it was going to piss me the fuck off. So I'm glad they had that. And they did a good job at making Harold funny, the mummy. And they 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 try to they tried to harp on that on the first one too, making Harold comedic and funny. I think they did great with that on both of these movies, the remake and the original. But the this uh, this remake they did a little bit better. There was a lot more funny moments. The issue is a lot of those funny moments lasted way too long. He's like messing with the honey and the remote way too long. Like I saw that throughout this movie. And Under Wraps 2, which came out in 2022 or 2023 or something like that. Both of these movies, they have scenes that last way too long. And I noticed the newer Disney Channel original movies are longer a little bit than the older ones. And I think that is so unnecessary. These movies are way too simple to be extending out scenes and having extra scenes. They had like an extra element to where it was like a school project that the girl had to do to find some information out. And they added this school project into it. They added this fact that this man was like a movie creator and he wanted to make a film for the project. And it's like, it didn't even apply to the movie. It's like they added that and then it never mattered. So it's like, you might as well have not added that in. So I didn't like that. And I feel like the character development was clearly lacking. Having a remake of the exact same movie from 1997 in 2021, it really shows you how much things have changed because the acting from the first movie was top tier. It was very believable. These char- the characters felt real. Their relationships with each other and with Harold felt so real. And in this movie, I felt like the character, the acting was so flat. And I know that's how Disney Channel wants the kids to act nowadays. But it's like, they're acting so animatedly and that's not believable. Especially when I've seen the same movie with them acting normally. Now it's easy for me to see that like, y'all are doing the most. Like, y'all are doing the most. And it's not even being executed well in my opinion so i felt like because the acting was that way the connection that i had to the characters was lacking i didn't feel like they really were friends i didn't feel like they really had a connection to harold the way the og marshall and the og harold really bonded and became friends you could really tell in the first movie like you really could tell like marshall wanted to take harold in marshall wanted to make sure harold had a good home and got back to his stuff This new age, Marshall, he didn't even want Harold to come to his house. So it's like, how do I believe by the end of the movie that he cares this much about him when y'all haven't really showed us, you know? And it's like, y'all did good with the, y'all did better with explaining why his relationship with with his mom was troubled. But y'all did worse at showing how Harold was the solution to that by teaching him how to care for someone. It's like, we did not get any of that. So by the end of the movie, I didn't give a damn. 
so I just think it fell way flatter than the first installment of the movie, the first version. So it's just, and then it made me feel like y'all really probably could have just did number two and y'all could have just left the original as the original and just did a number two way later in life, 20 years later. And then that probably would have been better. But of course they needed different characters. They probably wanted to reboot it um, so they could do number two. That was my theory. My theory was they had the concept for Under Wraps 2, the 2022 version. And they just wanted to reboot Under Wraps 1 so that they could do the concept for Under Wraps 2. And still have it be a con continuity of it all. Or maybe they did just want to reboot it. I don't know. But I like the concept. I like the movie. But this one didn't feel Halloween-y like the first one did. So I, I didn't like that either. I didn't, this reboot didn't feel that Halloween-y at all. I didn't fuck with that. Like I, the, the filter they had over the movie. And same with Invisible Sister. The filter for Invisible Sister in this, it doesn't feel Halloween-y. It feels like, I don't know. It, 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 it. It's like a whitish filter, and the white filter doesn't make me feel Halloweeny at all. They need to not use that for the Halloween movies because I wasn't feeling. They really don't need to use that filter at all. I fucking hate the little white filter they put on these movies, but this one in Invisible Sister had that, and it it it, it makes the movie feel less ambiance to what it's supposed to be feeling. So. I would I would give this movie two out of five stars. The concept is still good. The concept is still good, I will say. But I just it just it just was unnecessary compared to the others. I'll give it two out of five stars. Maybe two point five out of five stars. Maybe like right in the middle, like a five out of ten. Two point five or two. I'm not sure. Next we have number thirteen on the list. We getting up there. We finna be at top ten. Number thirteen on the list is Phantom of the Megaplex. Now, y'all, Phantom of the Megaplex was one of my childhood favorite movies. I am a huge fan of mysteries. I have a Scooby-Doo poster in my living room. I am in love with Scooby-Doo. I'm in love with mysteries. Mysteries always get me purring. You know what I mean? So I definitely love mysteries. And that is one of the reasons that I love this movie. This movie got a 6.2 out of 10 on IMDb, period, and a 57% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, growing up and watching this as a kid, it was my favorite. I loved it. I felt like it gave me the ambiance of Halloween. I felt like I loved Phantom of the Opera and I loved the play on Phantom of the Opera. And I remember feeling an actual intensity to the movie and me feeling connected to like the characters and the story. Now, to be honest, watching it as an adult, it fell flat. I was like, I'm not gagging as much as I was. It's not intense as as I thought it was. I think it did a better job at causing a feel of anxiety the way I want these horror movies to feel without it getting to that, you know, too scary for TV. And I think they were trying to find their balance of this one between Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire and then, which we'll talk about later, the movie that made them not want to have too many horror on Disney. And I think this tried to find a balance. and. I still think this leaned way toward too much towards Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire, where it's like there's not a lot of really scary scenes, which I guess is fine. But even the the conflict, it felt more intense as a kid. But when you're watching it as an adult, it's like, girl, don't nobody give a fuck that the theater is getting fucked up. You really don't. And I think what help would hurt this movie a lot was at the beginning they like are introducing. All of these characters who work at the theater, Scary Terry and Royal Ricky, a bunch of characters. And it's like, we don't give a fuck. Like, literally, all that time spent introducing those characters could have spent on adding more elements to the movie for the relevant characters. All it did was, like, confuse us on who mattered because none of those characters mattered. The main characters were the protagonist. What the fuck is his name? Pete. It was Pete, the protagonist, and then his two little siblings. They were the main people we needed to focus on, but y'all are sitting here introducing to us to all of the workers at the movie theater who don't really matter. They're really just side characters, so it doesn't matter to really introduce them. So that was the problem. It's like you're introducing all of these people, but 90% of them don't matter, and it's like drawing our attention and confusing us at the beginning of the movie. So... By the time we understand who really matters and the conflict starts happening and we see that the conflict is kind of mid, especially as an adult, it's like, oh, okay, girl, I'm not really gagging as much. So the main reason I still have this a little higher than the other ones is because of the, the nostalgia I feel 
And I do feel like this feels, to me at least, a little more Halloween-y. And I love a good mystery. This is like the only mystery movie they have on this list. They should do more mystery Halloween-themed movies because I feel like mystery is a way to give it that intense, scary feeling without it actually being scary you know what i'm saying i wish they would have like actually snatched up some of the kids that's what annoys me snatched up some of the kids sounds crazy i don't mean it like that but that's what annoys me is like i just feel like they 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 don't take any risks and i get not going too far with the scary shit but it's like they don't do anything because there's multiple points in this movie where the manager gets kidnapped and he gets tied up and it's like there's nothing, and then the kid, the main characters get tied up at the end too. There's nothing wrong with, okay, you introduce all these characters at the beginning because the Phantom of the Mechaplex starts snatching them up, and now it's like, where's Scary Terry? She got snatched. She got kidnapped. Where's everybody else? They got kidnapped. And by towards the end of the movie, the only person left is just the main character, and he has to figure out why all of the other people got kidnapped throughout the movie. That would have been interesting. And I feel like that's something they could have done and not gotten as much backlash for. Because it's like, we're just at a movie theater. They're just getting tied up in the hallway or in the back room. And it's like, they're just disappearing. You don't even have to, you don't even have to show them getting snatched up. You could just show them disappearing. You could show the phantom here and then the next thing they're gone. It's like, I feel like it was an easy way to cause a more intense conflict it didn't feel intense because i don't care that the fan is blowing all the people away in the movie theater what i would care is is if we didn't know where scary terry was the whole movie where the fuck is she is she okay and it's like i feel like that would have been a way to make this movie more intense and it would have put this movie in like the top 10 top five but they didn't execute it exactly the way they could have as a scary movie and then it was crazy because there's this random storyline with the mom and the stepdad and pete talks about at the beginning how he likes the stepdad and the mom should get with him and then at the end they get proposed and it's like y'all just wanted to throw in a proposal or like i feel like they wanted to throw in a big in scene situation so they randomly had the dad propose to the mom which i felt like was stupid and random and it didn't have anything to do with anything so that just felt forced and they shouldn't have did that either so yeah, it was mid as fuck. I would give this really a two out of 10. I would say this movie is one of the ones that I was talking about where it's like, this one is worse than like Zombies 2, Zombies 3 as a movie. Like as a movie, this one is not that good of a movie compared to those other ones, even under Wraps 2021 version. This one should be underneath all of those. It should even be under Invisible Sister as a movie. But my nostalgia and my attachment to it is why i have it un above all of those movies because they're all new age movies and i didn't watch them as a kid so this one was able to stand the test of time and in reality this is right above mom's got a date with a vampire so either mom's got a date with a vampire could have been up here because of this now nostalgia or this could have been down there because of how bad the movie was but in reality i feel like my personal attachment to phantom have a, of a, the megaplex was too strong versus I didn't have much of a personal attachment to Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire. I just remember liking it. So I was able to kind of separate them in a different way. But when it comes to the quality of movie, they about what and what, no shade. All right, number 12 on the list is The Scream Team. The Scream Team is one that I did not see as well. It was like a can of worms. I've never seen it. I've just heard about it. But I didn't even hear positive things about the scream team i just kind of like heard about it it didn't come on disney a lot at all it, it, and i don't know why actually i really don't know why it has a 6.2 out of 10 on imdb as 55 percent on rotten tomato so it's like okay man but honestly when i watched it it was okay like it was a pretty good disney channel movie like comparing it to the way they do halloween disney channel movies this was one of the best Honestly, this was one of the best Halloween Disney Channel movies, to be to be honest, to be real. I liked it a lot. The concept was fun. The concept was fun because basically what this movie was, was it's these two main characters, their siblings, Ian and somebody else. And Ian, their grandfather passes away and they were very close to their grandfather. And it, they end up finding out that ghosts are real and their grandfather needs to pass on from the human world to the afterlife. And they find this ghost center where people, where ghosts go from the human world to the afterlife. And they have to help their grandpa pass to the afterlife. 
concept eats, baby. The concept eats. And I feel like they did a very good job at explaining Ian's issue with his father. So Ian and his dad has a, has some arguments at the beginning about how his dad is talking down about his grandpa. And Ian is like, no, our granddad was a good guy and da 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 And we see that throughout the movie. And it's like, they expand that development very, very well. I think the ghost part of it all is very fun and Halloween-y. It felt very, very halloween there's like this lore about this evil ghost. And then we found out that he's evil because he was um, framed in the past. And it's like all of that lore feels very Halloween-y. It feels very fun. I actually really, really did like this movie. And I would have had it above some of these other movies if it had more a connection to me when it comes to nostalgia, honestly. But it was it was really good. I think some of my issues with it came to like, the, the movie kind of drug a little bit. This is the longest Halloween Disney Channel original movie. So there were times where like, it was dragging out. It didn't feel like a Disney movie at times. It kind of felt like just a regular Halloween movie that they played on Disney, which is fun and a positive. I just feel like, there was like a, a lack of characters that I cared for. There was like one main ghost character. I wish there was like, well, there were like two main ghost characters, but they were like older. I kind of wish they were like younger and also kids so I could feel more of a connection to it. I think this movie just lacks that oomph that makes you feel a connection to it. And I think that's why a lot of people aren't like, talking about it because it came out in 2002 which is relatively newer compared to some of these older ones but some of these older ones were shown more than it and i feel like there's just something about it that lacks a connection i don't really care about anybody in the story even though it's a great story i feel like it was told very well i feel like the conflict with the grandpa was very good i think one of the issues also is like the solution like they find out that this guy zachariah who is the evil ghost was just being framed. I felt like they kind of just read about it and found out about it. I didn't like that they just read about it. And then once they got to the solution of it all, I think the climax was really fun. Them having to like find a way to escape from Zachariah. Zachariah has all of these ghosts kind of like hidden in this thing and he's preventing them all from getting to the afterlife. And it's like, ooh, very intense. They, get, they did a good job at making an intense moment and you feel the urgency. But by the end, when Zachariah is defeated, and we find out the reason that the grandpa stayed by, behind. The grandpa's just like, yeah, I just needed to tell you, to tell the dad that I am proud of you because we had a turmoil in our relationship. And it's like, yes, it relates back to the dad and the main character's issue. And that's what was the gag. But it just felt like flat. It felt like it didn't seem like that's why you stayed behind at all. You didn't even talk to the dad the whole time. You're talking to the grandchildren the whole time. I don't know. I think the goal was to relate it back to the situation happening with the main character and the dad. But I don't know that it really hit it, hit the nail on the coffin. And it's a great movie. And I do like it better as a movie than some of the ones above it. It just lacks the connection that I feel to it that I felt to these other movies. So I would have to, but I would have to give it. Honestly, it was pretty good. I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. I'm not going to lie. I liked it. I felt like it had some positives. Um, It's above average for me. And there you go. It was a good one. This was really a good one. It probably deserves top 10. I'm not going to lie. I'm probably sleeping on it a little bit. I would definitely suggest to watch this if you haven't seen it. You, you should have a fun time. I had a fun time. It was very cute. Number 11 on the list. I have Zombies, the 2018 version. Zombies got a 6 out of 10 on IMDb and a 62% on Rotten Tomatoes. Zombies is surprisingly not bad. It's one of the movies where it came out after I was like obviously over Disney Channel. And it was the era where I was like, ugh, why are Disney movies all bad and stupid now? And it's like, now that I've went and I've watched some of these newer ones, I think it's ridiculous that I've been saying that. And a lot of people say that. And I think it's a little ridiculous because when I actually consume the, the stuff that they actually are putting out and I actually pay attention to it, it is just as good as the shit that was out when we were out. Not just as good. It's not just as good, but it's not as bad as I feel like we're making it. And that's my thing because... I've went back and I've watched some newer age, not too new, but I've watched some like 2017, 2018 Disney Channel shows. 
And I remember being like, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought it was. It isn't as corny as I thought it was. And zombies is actually a very serious concept that they're layering into a Disney movie. And that's why I have it so high. Let's just get into the pros and then I'll get into the cons. So for the positives, the concept of this movie is literally, bitch, segregation. They are literally like talking about what happened with black people and white people after slavery in this movie on Disney Channel. And it's really like a whole history lesson put in this. And it's actually fucking tea. Because basically, it's about how some people became zombies and they got put out and they put them in a town of their own. They separated everything they had from the real people and what the what the real humans had or the humans had. And so the humans get all of this positive thing. They get to go to cool schools. They get great houses. They get great cars, good food. And the zombies have to eat trash food, live in the trash neighborhood and live in the trash houses. And then this movie is the very first time zombies are allowed into the human school and they're integrated. And it's like, oh my God, this is literally the history of the United States being shown on this motherfucking movie. And I honestly feel like they executed it very, very well. It's like they have a forbidden Romeo and Juliet love story that intertwines with these two activists, one human and then the zombie Zed. And they meet each other. They start falling in love. And then they also start learning more about the other person's culture and realize that we can work together and we like we shouldn't be separate we're the same we're all people we're all deserving of everything that each other has and it's like they're learning how to destroy the system and that's what they do by the end of the movie they break down this system of segregation and try to advocate for equality between the zombies and the humans because everybody's the same and it's like bitch this shit is this the concept is tea bitch the concept is tea and i felt like the aesthetic of the movie was so so cute like i loved how the zombie town looked it looked so cool and then the human town i love the pink and the blue like the aesthetic of the movie was super super cute to me i genuinely i was tuned the fuck in like if i was a kid and this was on Disney, I would love zombies. I'm not going to lie. Like, the concept is tea. The aesthetic is cute. The main characters, they're adorable. Like, it's all tea for real. The forbidden love story is tea. One of my only issues, and it's, it's... One of my only issues is, why is it a musical? I do not understand why is it a music. Why it's a musical. I really don't. I don't get it. Um, The music isn't terrible. The songs are actually okay. They're, they're okay. I just miss when it made sense for movies to be musicals. Because with High School Musical, they were literally doing a musical. That was literally the movie. So it made sense that it was a musical. With Camp Rock, they were literally at a music camp. So it made sense that it was a musical. With Teen Beach Movie, they literally got pulled into a musical movie. So it made sense that it was a musical. And I just kind of miss where there was a reason for them to be singing. I know I know musicals are just musicals because they're musicals. There doesn't have to be a reason for it for them to be singing. It's kind of like a play. It's like they're on Broadway and they're doing wicked and in the in within the story, they're progressing the story by singing in the song i don't have a problem with it and while watching it it kind of annoyed me because it wasn't the same as my childhood but when i take a step back there's nothing wrong with it being a musical it just is a musical i think the issue is is that it started to feel like everything disney was dropping was a musical freaky friday the reboot is randomly a musical there's some of these other halloween movies where they start singing it's like why are they singing and i think It put a bad taste in my mouth about why does everything need to be a musical nowadays? But honestly, Disney is built up on music, which is why Descendants was a musical, because all of the Disney princess movies are musicals. So Disney has always done musicals. It shouldn't really be an issue at this point. So I'm going to try to get over it. But I feel like this story in particular could have been told very easily without them singing. And I like the concept of this story so much that a part of me wishes they weren't singing throughout it because the concept could be focused on a little more heavier. But I think the musical part balances out the true heaviness of the actual concept. And maybe that's what they were going for. And in that kind of scenario, I kind of like it. And I kind of wish this was top 10. 
because I feel like it deserves top 10 because it the concept eats and all of that eats. One of my issues, though, is that it doesn't feel Halloween-y. And this is one of the movies that actually didn't come out around Halloween Town. All of the zombie movies around Halloween time, sorry. All of the zombie movies came out in February. And it's kind of more pushed towards Valentine's Day, I think, which is cute, I guess. But it's not pushed around Halloween time because it's really not Halloween themed. They're just monsters. And I think because they're monsters, it can be shown around Halloween time. But in reality, it's really just a regular movie involving monsters. So I think that's why I also don't put it too high because I'm looking for the Halloween feel, the pumpkins and the and the and the costumes and the lore. And it's like all this really had, especially in this first movie, was just zombies. And it's like that's not Halloweeny enough for me. So I couldn't really put it higher because of that. But overall, pretty good movie. I would give it a 3.5 out of 10. And I would say it's pretty good. I actually <laughs> I actually really enjoyed it and I really liked the concept and the music was actually cute. So they did a good job for what they did. No shade. Period. All right, we're at the top 10, bitch. Okay. Number 10 I have Under Wraps 2, the 2022 version. Now, like I said earlier, I felt like they only made the first Under Wraps because they really had the concept for Under Wraps 2 and bitch the quality of the movies makes me feel like so because Under Wraps 2, I actually really fucking enjoy, bitch. Like, oh my God. First of all, shout out to the diversity. Me personally, I love seeing brown people on the screen. Okay, thank you. So shout out to the diversity, number one. Number two, Under Wraps 2 did, I feel like, everything I needed for Under Wraps 1 and even the Under Wraps OG I needed I needed this from them. It felt way more Halloweeny than the first and then the 2021 version of Under Wraps. Like they actually had Halloween themed parties. They had Halloween like the the town Halloween um festival thing. All of those things gave me that Halloween energy and they took that ugly ass filter off. Thank God. So I loved all of those elements. It made me feel so it made me feel everything I needed from the 2021 version and even a little bit from the first 1997 version, this gave me because I needed more mummy and they gave me more mummy. I needed more Halloweeny. It gave me more Halloweeny. I needed more drama. It gave me more drama. Like I needed this. Oh, girl, this got a 4.6 out of 10 on IMDb and a 32% on Rotten Tomatoes. They weren't gagging. And I will say I watched it with my friend as well. And my friend was like, he wasn't gagging either. He did not care for this movie at all, which I get because by that time we had just watched the first one, which was a dud. No shade. Um, At least the newer version was a dud. But this one, honestly, I loved it. I loved the new plot where it's like there's this third mummy who's chasing Harold and his girl. I loved kind of the lore behind that. I think some of my issue was they had the, and this is what they do with the newer Disney Channel movies. They had the characters literally explaining the synopsis. When you go and you read the synopsis on the internet, there's a scene in the movie where they're in the car and they're literally reading the same fucking synopsis that we just read about it in the fucking car on the movie on the screen to the audience. And it's like, no, you don't just tell the reader the synopsis of the movie. You just show the reader the synopsis. We already started to get it because it started off and we understood that this evil mummy liked Harold's girlfriend mummy and that's why he was going to kind of try to get her back and then they just have the characters read that exact same shit we get it we're not fucking stupid well obviously we're adults but even kids children are not stupid you don't have to explain to them word for word exactly what's about to happen in the movie we get it and I think that's one of the cons of the newer Disney Channel movies they start thinking that kids are stupid and they add all these extra details an exposition and then i do think there's like a there's a there's an increase in what's it called like like there's a decrease in attention span so i think they add a lot of different random elements to try to keep our like the viewers attention which i do get because we're in the age of tiktok baby where it's 30 second videos get it quick out fast but I feel like if you're going to make a movie, you don't have to add extra irrelevant details in the movie to make people more attentive. Just make the movie more intense. And I feel like 
what they did was they added a lot of different elements here, which I was fine with. I think it worked for this movie. For the first movie, it, it felt extra. But for this movie, I feel like everything they had was mostly relevant. And I do love that. And I feel like it all flowed together very well. This was a good, fun story. There were a lot of different settings. And I love that there were a lot of different settings. A lot of these Disney Channel movies, they stay in one or two settings. And that's that causes a lack of attention. Like, that's where my attention span goes away. This movie having a lot of different settings was positive. I loved it. I just feel like they kind of extended some of the scenes out for too long. Like, when the mummies were being funny and dancing or when they're making the popcorn or whatever the fuck it is, they extend those scenes out for way too long. I don't care that much. Like, show us a little bit and then move forward. And because of those extra scenes of them showing these fun, whimsical-looking things, trying to get our attention... It's really losing my attention because you're spending too much time on that and not on the actual plot. But honestly, I think the villain was T. The fact that the villain had a, a, mum, a minion was T. Like the concept was T. And then Marshall having the conflict with feeling like the third will in his friendship. That was T. They really ate it. They ate, they ate, they ate, they ate. They ate for me. This ate. One of my qualms, though, is the same thing I said about Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire. Make this villain feel more intense. Like, he, I liked the villain, but I wish he was making more people minions other than just the one person or tossing people around. They had one scene where he, like, picked up the jeweler with his little staff, and that felt intense, and that got me back interested. But I wish he was going around the town terrorizing the town. Like, that's what we need in these type of movies to stay interested. I needed him to be making everybody a minion or making everybody frozen and they can't move or throwing everybody around because then it adds an intensity to the movie to where I can actually stay interested. Because nothing was happening to the townspeople, I kind of didn't care. He wasn't hurting any of them. He wasn't doing anything to them. He was just, like, ripping up papers and shit. So it's like I genuinely didn't feel an intense an intenseness from the villain so i started to lose interest throughout the middle of the movie or whenever the villain wasn't interacting with the main character so that was my main issue and i feel like it slows down the movie and it made the movie feel way longer than when it even was and then it made people like my friend not really interested in it because it's not there's no conflict that's consistently intensifying throughout the movie so that was my only issue but everything else i really did like this was a pretty damn good movie i loved it the funny parts were funny the intense parts were intense the emotional parts were emotional um the gay wedding was fun <laughs> shout out to representation okay so i i had a good time i love this movie i'm gonna give it a 3.5 out of 10 not many notes okay just make that make that villain a little more intense next time but they did good period Surprise, this is the lowest IMDb rating. Probably because people hate the um quotations woke agenda. That's what it is. Y'all mad because they got black characters. Stay mad. Okay. Boom. Number nine. Girl, this one is a little high. Now, some of the younger, I mean, the older Gen Z girlies, like myself, are going to be like, hold on. But number nine, I have girl versus monster. Bitch. When I say... Growing up, I was Olivia Holt's number one hater. I did not like that girl. But this movie was actually pretty fucking good, bitch. Like, it, it, was, it was a good Disney movie. It really, really was. So Girl vs. Monster got a 5.3 out of 10 on IMDb. It's not showing me the Rotten Tomatoes. Maybe they don't care. To me, it was, it was, it was a good movie. I feel like it was a good decom, is what I will say. Because... To me, this followed more of the old. It was like it came out in the transitional period from old school to newer school because this came out in 2012, a little bit closer to newer school, I will say. But 2012 was the area where it's like the last Halloween decom they had was like Twitches 2 in like 2009 or something like that. And then this was like four years later. So it's like it was gaining the understanding of adding more elements to the movie but it wasn't adding too many to where we wouldn't get distracted and then it also was still i don't know it had it had the positive elements from the old school and the positive elements from the new school it didn't go too far in one direction or the other and i feel like it had such a good middle ground to where i was able to enjoy a lot of the different 
elements. It was way more Halloween-y than I thought it would be because I thought it was going to give regular monsters. I loved that the monsters were a scarecrow and a witch and like this this warlock person. Like I loved that because I never had seen the movie. So I always was like, oh, it's just random monsters. She's fucking fighting. This isn't Halloween. No, it's like Halloween themed monsters. Like I loved that part. Like I really needed it to be Halloween-y for me to actually enjoy it. And it was. So that really made me feel positively about it. The comedy between the mom and the dad of this movie was so tea. It reminded me of Ileana and Clark, Clark, whatever, from Twitches. The Twitches, their little handler people they had, how they would bicker all the time. That was the same comedic like timing and energy that they had in this movie. Like they really did good at Im- implementing funny comedic elements with the right characters and at the right moments. And then the main character, her issue, I didn't like her internal conflict. It was that she has no fear, but now she finally feels fear because of this person who's chasing her. I didn't necessarily love that, but um, it was fine. Like, it was okay. And what I did love was the actual villain. The villain, Diamata, this is one of the best villains on Disney Channel. She was so involved. We got introduced to her at a good early time, which I love. I really need to be introduced to the villain early. That's another thing that Under Wraps 2 did well. They introduced us to the villain early in the movie. And in old school Disney Channel, we wouldn't really get the villain early enough for me. It was pissing me off because we didn't get the villain to the last fucking five minutes. But with these newer movies, the elements that Girl vs. Monster had from the newer movies was introducing the villain early. And then from the older movies, it was that comedic timing and having the comedic essence to it. And then trying to have an element of an internal conflict with the main character. And I think that they did, they at least included all of those parts. And I love it. They didn't execute them all perfectly, which is why it's not like number one. But I loved all of those elements. And Diamato was a good ass villain. I loved how she was so active. I love how much we got to see her and her two minions, like her two main Halloween minions. And then she made someone else. She like entered the body of the the main bully girl in the movie and i loved that as well that was a cool scene where she entered her body i really loved all of those little elements and it was giving halloweeny it kind of had a spy kids tease to it i don't know if y'all have seen the troop on nickelodeon but the troop on nickelodeon was one of my favorite movies ever and it kind of has a the troop type kind of element to it with them having to hunt these monsters it literally felt like a movie that you make a movie and then you turn into a TV show like they did with My Babysitter is a Vampire. It was a movie and then they turned it into a TV show. That's what this felt like. Mind you, My Babysitter is a Vampire is not considered a decom. I don't know what the fuck it's considered now that I'm thinking about it, but it was not on that list of decoms unless I fucking missed it because I'm literally thinking about it now and it's like, what the fuck? Where was that? Oh, I think it's Canadian. It is Canadian. So it, it, it is a decom. I should have fucking did. Oh, my God. I'm fucking mad. Because it wasn't on the it wasn't on the decom list. Let me go check. It's not on the list. I think it's because it is a Canadian show. It's like Life with Derek. I don't know if y'all have seen Life with Derek. Life with Derek, I loved, but it was also a Canadian show. So it's like it's a Canadian movie that Disney Channel I think bought, and they would show it on Disney Channel. But it's not actually a Disney Channel movie so it wasn't on the list but my babysitter is a vampire probably would be fucking top top five bitch that was a good ass fucking movie but anyways it has that tease because it feels like it could have been made into a show but it wasn't which is actually surprising because it's like this was a good ass fucking concept like they're basically hunting they're like monster hunters but it's like halloween monsters love it um what i didn't like a few stuff which is like some of these newer age elements why the fuck was she a singer and i the pro is it gave an another element to the main character, and I like them adding layers to the main character. But the con is I don't need to hear her sing. Like, literally, to save the day, she sung. Ugh! 
Y'all are pissing me off. And that's why it makes people not want to watch movies like Zombies because it feels like y'all are forcing musicals into every situ- situation. Not every movie needs to have music in it. And it, it wasn't even a musical. She just sung like two songs throughout the movie. And it's like, why are you singing? This was a regular movie. It was fun. And then she started singing. I, I just I just can't do it. And then there was like a lot of corny moments where it's like, this isn't funny. It's just corny. Like one of the issues with the friend is that she felt insecure because she couldn't spell goat. And it's like, the idea seems funny, but then there are scenes where it's like, the villain of her is like, spell goat. And she's like, G, I, oh no, G, E. And it's like, <laughs> and it's like, I feel like, just say she can't spell goat, so that's funny. Don't continue to bring it up and then have her try to spell it. Shit like that makes it corny. And I feel like they had a few elements that made it corny. Even at the end, to kind of conquer these these monsters, they have to show no fear. And so at the end, it's like one of the boys is conquered by the monster and he's taken over. And she's like, no, just just do something that makes you afraid. Do something that you're scared of so you can unconquer it. And he says, I, I like you. I like you. And when he says, I like you, the monsters come out comes out of him. And it's like, yay, the monster came out of you, but that was corny as fuck for you to scream I like you and that be the solution to the problem. And then it's corny as fuck that they're singing and that be the solution to the problem. So all of those elements, those corny parts, it really just puts an itch in my ass and it really makes me annoyed. So I have to give it a 3.5 out of 10. Still a really good movie. Still up there. I really was fucking with it. But the corny movie mo- moments prevent it from really being any higher than that for me, honestly. So there's that. For number eight, I have Under Wraps, the 1997 OG version, period. Under Wraps got a 6.5 out of 10 on IMDb. I think that makes sense. Now, first of all, shout out to Under Wraps because Under Wraps is the first, technically, the first Disney Channel original movie. It's the first ever DCOM. There was one before it, but it wasn't considered a DCOM yet. So the Under Wraps is like the OG, OG DCOM, period. And it's a Halloween movie. And I feel like that's just, I don't know, that alone deserves top 10. It should probably be higher than this because of that. I'm not even going to lie. It's just really the OG originator. And I feel like that history makes me like it even more. And then also, I do have like a personal connection to this movie because when I was young, I would watch Under Wraps here and there a lot. And I I don't know. I love the movie. I really loved I really loved and enjoyed the movie. The reason I feel like I kind of brought it down on this ranking is because when I went back and I watched it doing my rewatch, I was like, okay, there's a there's a lot of lag time within this movie that could be filled with more interesting elements. And I feel like, I think what it is, is it's just a very simple movie. And I think the simplicity was beautiful and it worked. And I love that it's simple, but it worked so much well, so much better in the time that it was released in 1997. Nowadays, movies have been so much more fast paced and there's kind of always something going on. And to me, that's a little overwhelming. I would prefer a middle ground, but this movie was just very, very lax sometimes in the middle. And let me explain, because I know if you're, if you're probably watching, you're probably like, what are you talking about? Because there's a lot going on. In the middle of the movie, it's kind of where um, Harold, the mummy, is exploring the world and trying to figure out like he's getting lost throughout the world and they're trying to kind of find him and for me that part lasted too long because i didn't necessarily care about him getting lost as a kid that part would be t as fuck and i probably would have enjoyed it and i think as a kid's movie this is pretty pretty good and i would probably even put it higher if i was rating them as kid movies Honestly, if I was writing it as a kid's movie, I would probably feel a little better because some of the movies above it, I feel, are just good movies in general to the general population. And that's kind of why I rate it this lower, because everyone can't watch Under Wraps and enjoy it. I think you kind of have to be a certain age to watch it and enjoy it. And a lot of the movies above it, you can enjoy it as an adult or as a kid or regardless. And for me, it was a movie I loved as a kid, but as an adult, it's like it fell a little flat at the times where it wasn't intense enough. I've been saying it, but it's like, I need a lot of intense moments throughout the movie to keep me interested without it being overbearingly a new scene every second. It doesn't have to be like that. It didn't have to, they didn't have to add scenes. 
I just think in some of the scenes where Harold is figuring out the world, it could have been more intense situations. Like he could have been almost about to fall off a building. He could have been getting hit by a car. Something that's a little bit more, I feel like drastic. And then also I need the stakes to be high. I think the stakes were a little unclear with this movie. Like we we found out halfway through that the uh, the the owner of of the house was actually trying to steal Harold and take him away. It wasn't clear enough for me. I didn't fully get what he wanted, what his motivation was. I don't know. I, I wasn't I wasn't understanding fully. I still barely understand. Like, what did he need? What did he want? He just wanted to sell them. Like, I don't know. It didn't it didn't seem as intense. And the stakes weren't as high because no offense. No, fuck it. Offense to this mummy. Hell is not a human. You know? So for me, it it's what makes things more intense is if it's real people who I can connect to that are effective. To me, in my mind, Harold's already dead. So I don't care if Harold gets taken and sold off to somebody. He dead. He's going to be a mummy forever. If the kids were now going to be targeted and they were like, we need to kill these kids, that would have made me like, ooh, like Marshall, you better run and da 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 So those were the elements that I was like, okay, I can't really put it above some of these movies above it, but it's still a really good movie. I love the characters of this movie. Like this was damn near the best character building the or the second best. Or the second best. But this was like either the best or the second best character building that I've seen on any of these movies for sure. I loved, I loved, loved, loved the character building for this movie. Marshall's character. All I wish is that we saw more of his involvement with his mom before we got the whole end scene where he's um, telling his mom, it's okay that you married Ted. I don't care. I love you. And I learned that like, I don't think they did a good job explaining the lesson that he needed to be learned throughout the movie. I think they just kind of threw the lesson in our face at the end of the movie. And I was like, okay, I didn't really get this at the beginning. And like I said, the 2021 version did better at explaining that. So that was the element that I wish this had. But other than that, Marshall felt human and real. Gilbert felt human and real. Amy felt human and real. Even Harold felt real. I think the acting back in the day or what was expected from a kid's movie was less gimmicky than what it is now. Now that these actors are working on kids' movies, they want them to talk like this and yes, and oh my God, and da 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 But back then it's like, just talk how you talk and just give real emotion and really act. And I feel like the acting in these older movies were just more real and raw. So you got to really believe in the characters. And when I'm watching the newer movies, it just seems so animated in a way that it's not necessarily to be animated. Like, In zombies, it's okay to be animated because the world they live in is a very animated world. So it works for zombies. But for instance, in Under Wraps 2021, I think the actors were great, but especially in that first movie, it felt so mechanical. It felt like they were playing characters because of how um, exaggerated their voices were and everything was. And I feel like if they would have toned it down, like the tone of this movie, it would have just felt more real instead of like as if I knew I was watching a movie and this felt so real I love the actors love the characters still love the storyline the storyline eats I think it gives very much so Halloween especially this one like it was nighttime a lot of the time and that was very beneficial because I feel like having Halloween movies where it's always day if they're not in literally a Halloween town then it's it's killing the vibes. It needs to be nighttime, bitch. It needs to be dark. I need to be feeling dim. All of that. So definitely, definitely had its pros. And I feel like its highs are higher than some of these other people's highs, but its lows kind of make it bring it down above below some of these other movies. Um, but yeah, really good movie. Really did like it. I would give it honestly, I would give this movie. Four out of five stars, which I know is going to be higher than some of the movies I have above it. So maybe I should have moved this one a little higher because I really fuck with it. But it's just those slow moments. It's so slow moments. But I just think this is what I think. I think for the time it came out in and for what it was intended to be, it's a four out of five star movie. But I think now that time has passed and we're in 2021, this movie in 2021 
is I wouldn't say is a four out of five in 2021, but I know that when it was created and what it was intended for, it was an amazing movie in that time. And I, it's easy to see that with this movie. With some of the other movies, it's a little bit harder. And that's why it's like, I kind of don't care to allocate the, the score. But, you know, this movie had a special place in my heart. I understand what it was attacking, and I think it did good. And then the fact that it had a reboot, because I'm also, we haven't got into any of the movies that talk about impact. This is the first movie that we've talked about that has an impact. And if it has an impact on the other Disney Channel movies, if it has an impact on Halloween movies itself, I feel like it's appropriate for me to like bump it up. It was the first ever decom. It was the first ever Halloween decom and it has a whole reboot and I feel like the impact it has is is very it eats and that puts it above all the ones below it for me. So, I'm just boom, number 8. Number 7, Girl is getting down to the wire. Now, we finally have probably some of y'all faves are about to start coming up. Number 7, I have Halloween Town High. Ooh, this might be controversial for some of the girls who like Halloween Town High and feel like Halloween Town High is their favorite. For me, Halloween Town High might be my least favorite. That's the thing. Halloween Town is a hard one to rate, I will say, because I think all four of the movies are really good. They're in this top seven, so I'm not saying it's a bad movie, Um, but it's just it's very difficult to rate, and I'm going to get into why. So Halloween Town High got a six out of ten on IMDb. And it's 64% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think that's fine. Because I do think this movie is good in a lot of ways. But I do think it lacks certain things in a lot of ways as well. Halloween Town, being a series, immediately makes it the most iconic thing of this list. There's four movies in this series. It's the biggest series in this, in this ranking I'm doing. And that automatically has impact. Halloween Town, Halloween Town in general is perfect for the Halloween setting. But I think this movie, Halloween Town High, felt the least Halloweeny to me, honestly, um, which is crazy. It did feel Halloweeny still, don't get me wrong. But because they weren't in Halloween Town, to me, that was like not a negative because I like that they explored it, but it made it feel less Halloweeny than the than the other ones, honestly. And that's a big thing for me. I really want it to feel very Halloweeny, and I feel like even though we got to see all of these characters come to the human world and be in human high school, which is a great concept, love the concept, and that's one of the reasons it's high. Um, even though we got to see that, we didn't get to see their their experiences that often we were mainly focusing on marnie and what she was trying to do with her goal of making sure they can ingratiate into the into the situation a part of me wishes i got more scenes of the new characters interacting in the real world we had that one montage and that was basically it because even when they went to the mall we weren't focusing on them until they started screaming and they started getting attacked. We were focusing on Marnie and this random boyfriend who turned out to not even be the villain. And we were focusing on him the whole time. And it's like, there were so many scenes of him. And that was so unnecessary. That's another thing. They love to put, um, what's it called? Love interests in these movies. And it's so not necessary, especially in Halloween Town. I feel like, it made sense for the first movie. It made sense for the second movie. This movie, it made no sense for the love interest to be there. He was fully irrelevant. And I, I think it was to dis- to make the viewer feel like he was the villain. Because in the past, Marnie's love interest is the villain. Girl, what the fuck do Marnie be doing? We got to talk about that. Marnie falls in love with every evil person who she can. Like, she makes sure to make sure. Not just Marty. Her mama, her grandmama, her, her brother, all of them love them some evil, some evil people. They love them an evil person. And it's like, damn! Why do you love evil people so much? I don't get it. But anyway. <laughs> but anyways, um, I think it was trying to psych us out. And it's like, you spent so much time trying to psych us out. You should have been showing us the exploration of these kids in this new world a little bit more. All we really got was them joining them joining shit at school, joining clubs at school, and them at the mall. There was so much more shit you could have did, and I don't like that they didn't spend time doing it. So 
that was my con. That's why it's not that high compared to the other Halloween towns specifically. And honestly, I probably should have put this under under wraps. I'm not going to lie, but it, 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 it is because the impact that this particular movie has, this isn't where the impact is coming from. The impact is coming from the OG Halloween town, but I just feel like the entire series of Halloween town is just so, so huge for literally Halloween in general. Fuck Disney. Halloween in general. People of all people who, who weren't even Disney kids know what Halloween town was, bitch. Old people know what Halloween town was, bitch. So it's like the impact is just too extreme. It's hard for me to put it really low. But yeah, this was my least favorite. I also wasn't a big fan of the conflict this this time. I like that it was to try to get humans and monsters to work together and live accordingly. But I think it was too big of a concept for them to put in this one little movie. It makes zero sense that now that Marnie has achieved them going to high school in human world, that now the humans are going to accept them. Like, that doesn't make sense. You're in this one small town, in this one small human city, in this one small human situation, in this one small human town hall festival, and we're supposed to believe that the entire world is believing in, in, in monsters? And I know that's like a, you know, it's a kid's movie, but even as a kid, that's like a stupid concept. Like, no way... Like, like, it was just too big of a goal for them to have achieved it in this movie. They should have done more in this movie if that was the huge goal. And I just don't like that goal. I feel like they should have made a more achievable goal for her. But we moved. So it was still good. And I think the main thing that's keeping this up for me is the impact that Halloween Town has. And it was a fun idea. The idea of bringing them to high school is super fun and super cool. Even the mystery of who is the villain and us having to figure it out and homegirl getting kidnapped and put in the glass. I wish more people had got kidnapped. It only being one person is kind of like a dud. Boom. Put. I wish it was more and it kind of lasted consistently because I love a good mystery. But I, I just feel like it, it did good with the concept, but they could have did more with it. And they could have, like, added certain things to make it more interesting. And I think the reason that they were inhibited of making it more interesting is because they were trying to achieve this goal that Marnie wanted, which I feel like was too big. And it's not even too big because the goal really is just for the kids to be able to go to school in, in um, the real world. But it kind of expanded to, it's okay, let's mix the real world and the Halloween towns and they can be themselves. And it's like, it should have never expanded there. Her goal should have just been to get kids to go to Halloween Town, not to get the worlds to come back and collide and we can work together and uh 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 let's just leave it at they can get to go to high school and let's focus on all the high school elements. Let's focus more on them ingratiating in high school rather than I guess the whole big thing at the end. Cause it made the ending fall flat for me. I didn't care that they all revealed themselves to the humans because I'm like, this is unbelievable like this is not believable. No way this worked. I don't know, but uh, there were good things, and then there were things I didn't really like. I would give this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Like I said, it could be under 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 other wraps if you want it to be. But um, I think the impact Halloween Town has was just too much for me to handle. So, number six. Ooh, we almost at top five, y'all. Number six, I have Return to Halloween Town. Now, look. This was, growing up, this was the Halloween Town I watched the least. I didn't even remember what happened when we went and watched it on my rewatch. But girl, this was a good little movie. This was a good movie. I, I didn't love the conflict. I'm a conflict guy. The main problem has to be good. I didn't love this conflict. It felt like Marty, Marty didn't have much agency until really for a while because at the beginning all she wanted to do was go to do the university which wasn't enough for me she got to university and i wish she would have stumbled upon a mystery and figured it out but what happened was she was in class and the villains which was all the professors at the school were pushing her towards this this box and then the box just pops up and they basically give it to her and they basically say open it I wish it would have been more Marnie's agency and that it still could be the villains planting the box. But the fact that it was in the middle of the classroom, it's like there's no secret here. I wish it was secretive. I wish 
the villains were less able to be so involved in it. I wish it would have made it harder for them because if it was more so the professors knew it was on campus, but they didn't know how to find it. They needed Marnie to find the box and they kind of like dropped like a map and then she had to go find it secretively and she had to go behind people's back. It would have made Marnie have more agency and it would have made it seem more interesting to me at the beginning. So the beginning part for me, I didn't love. It was the end part of the movie that I loved. Once she decided that she wanted to find the key for this box, that's when it started getting interesting. And she started researching and she was learning about how Splendora, um, her past relative, was the one who had it. And she went back in time and then we saw the big twist and the gag. That part was was very, very good. And I liked that part. And I loved the idea of the university element, too. So it's like those are the two things that carried it for me. But even talking it out now, it's like there were there weren't a lot of things that I loved about this movie. I think it was just fan service for me. Like we got to see different types of monsters. We got to see different types of witches. The three um, villain um, mean girl witches were super iconic and cunts, period. Marnie, um, them changing Marnie's actor was was hilarious, but she did a good job. I ain't even gonna hold her. But seeing Marnie in a university setting, that was fun. But I didn't love her her friends this this season. I wish she had someone who went back in time with her because her genie friend was a dud. Her brother is always a dud and was still a dud. So it was basically just Marnie. And I didn't like that. And I felt like the goblin or, yeah, the goblin she was befriending could have just been Luke from the first and second movie. And I hate that it wasn't Luke from the first and second movie because it's like, that could have been her love interest and that would have made more sense. Instead, they made her love interest the villain from last the from the last movie and that fell flat. Once again, we don't need a love interest. That was stupid as fuck. I really hated that he was a love interest. I felt nothing from that at all. And honestly, this was the last movie I watched. So I think it was the one I had the most bias on when I rated it, ranked it. But if I'm being honest, this is probably under under wraps and Halloween Town High. Now that I'm talking it out, this is probably number eight. Under wraps is probably like number seven, and then Halloween Town High is probably number six because it's just there's a lot of st- parts about it that I I didn't love. But um, it just it was a lot of fan service. It made me feel good about Halloween Town. I got to be in Halloween Town again. We got to see her explore a different part of Halloween Town at the university. So it was a lot of fun elements but in general the movie itself i didn't love the conflict it wasn't eating this needs to be lower bitch this needs to be lower i regret it officially this probably needs to be below girl versus monster i'm not even gonna lie this not this needs to be number nine girl versus monster needs to be number eight under wraps needs to be number seven Halloween Town High needs to be number six, or maybe even flip them. But like I said at the beginning of the of the episode, this was a hard ranking. I'm not gonna lie. You could move these around here and there. It's just the gist of it all. Now the top five is where I need to lock in, and I'm not locked in, y'all. I'm not. I'm not locked in. I'm not gonna lie. Even looking at this top five, it's like I don't even know if I agree that this is the top five, y'all. This is harder than it looks. This is harder than it looks or it sounds. I'm so sorry. But let's let's just get into the top five. Damn, is this true? This isn't true. I think I need to switch these. <laughs> Y'all, please. I'm sorry. Bear with me, please. Uh, number five and number four are hard, and they're interchangeable. Y'all, number five and four are interchangeable. But I'm gonna give number five. <sighs> what am I gonna give number five to? I'm so sorry. I'm gonna give number five to Halloween Town Two. To Halloween Town 2, Calabar's Revenge. So, Halloween Town 2, that is the Halloween Town that I've probably seen the most. Maybe not seen the most. I think I've seen the first one more. But I've seen Halloween Town 2 a lot. And when I did my rewatch, I was like, wait a minute. This isn't as good as I thought it was. It was like a very simple movie. Kind of like under wraps. But I started to remember like when I was a kid and how I was feeling when I was watching this. Very different. And then also... It's okay for a movie to be simple and it could still be good. I think I was just expecting or remembering it more than what it was. So when I was watching, I was a little disappointed. But after taking a step back, the impact this movie had, astronomical. I loved the impact that this movie had. And honestly, just to start off with some of the pros, I did like that the villain was 
the son of the villain from the first movie. I enjoyed that. I feel like they they ingratiated the first two movies together very well. And it almost feels comfortable. It almost feels like you have to watch them together. And it kind of makes this movie better knowing that you're coming right off of the first Halloween Town to this story arc with his son. So I really did enjoy that. And I jo- enjoyed the conflict, how he put a spell on Halloween Town and everyone was not who they were supposed to be. They were the opposite. That is like super impactful and conflicting for me. And I love a good conflict. And I feel like because they have to save the entire town, similar to number one, we have to save the entire town. The stakes are so high. And I really appreciate that the stakes are so high. And then they give them this time crunch. And they say, if you don't make it by the end of midnight, you're going to be stuck in Halloween Town forever. And it's like, yes, not only do they have to save the entire town, they also have this time crunch. And I really love the time crunch that they have. So I love the conflict. Those were definitely the pros. I love the expansion of Halloween Town. We got to see a little bit more of Halloween Town with Gort's with Gort's place, we got to see them go back in time. And I do enjoy that aspect of it all as well, that they expanded a little bit on the lore. But I don't like that they didn't expand a lot. We kind of only got to see Gort's place at Halloween Town. That's my issue. We didn't go a lot of places in Halloween Town. There weren't a lot of different settings. And that's what kind of like, ugh, turned me off about this movie and couldn't make me put it any higher. I like a few different settings. That was one of the things I really loved about Under Wraps 2, the 2022 version, is that they had so many different settings and it was so satisfying to see the characters in different areas. They went to the town hall festival. They went to the um, the, the Airbnb where the where the wedding was going to be at. They started off at the their hometown where they started where they ended off at the last um, one. They went to the museum where the mummies were held. So many different. They were in the car. So many different settings, and I love different settings in the movie because it really like helps us go on a journey with them. And I feel like with this was giving us was a journey but they were lacking journey in the fact that we only went to Gort's place I wish there was another step from Gort's place before we got to the end of the movie and it would have made the movie 10 times more better because of that and I felt like it was holding it back you know so yeah wasn't a fan of that and I wasn't a fan of the way Cal got revealed he got revealed really early as the villain And I kind of wish they would have let that go a little bit more. Imagine if Cal stole the book and then he went to Halloween Town with Marty and Grandma and he was pretending to help them solve the mystery. And it wasn't until later that we found out he was the villain all along. It's like that would have been a little bit more interesting to me. I think if the viewer knows he's the villain, which we did when he stole the book and we're watching him pretend with Marty the whole time, it's like, ooh, that's building tension for us as the viewer. Like, oh my God, Marnie doesn't know, but we know. Marnie, figure it out, figure it out. It's him, it's him. And then there could have been a big moment of her being like, it's you. Instead, we have him popping up as a big ass head in the middle of Halloween Town, right when they get, literally right when they get to Halloween Town, he pops up and he's like, yeah, girl, it was me. I stole your book. I don't fuck with you. You fuck with my daddy and you gotta go. And it's like, why did it get revealed like that? That was super stupid. And I feel like that was that was very easy. I don't know. I just didn't love him as a villain, I think is what it is. I, I didn't love him as a villain. I loved that he was related to Calabar from first from the first movie. But him and himself as a villain, I wasn't too gagged. I feel like we didn't get enough development from who like who is he? He was immediately a villain. And it's like I really wish, like I was saying, that he was with Marnie pretending to be a hero for a little bit longer. It didn't even have to be too much longer. I just feel like he could have went to Halloween Town with him. He could have been gagged with him. And then they could have had another setting that he led them to where he was trying to trap them or something. And they figured out, yeah, that was like, I, I, could, I could make a whole nother movie. But I'm just saying, like, I really wish that he was a little bit more expanded. So that that was it. But still top five. Still a really good movie. Still up there. And the impact it has on me, bitch. This was one of my movies growing up. I feel like it led, it helped lead to the series of Halloween Towns. Because Halloween Town 1, of course, that launched it. But this movie had to do its thing for them to continue to have it on. And I think it did. And I do feel like this is one of the Halloween Towns that are watched a lot alongside number three, Halloween Town High. 
But that's thing. All of them are watched a lot. And I feel like the Halloween impact, it it just, it transcends. And this was still a very fun movie. It's just certain things they could have tweaked. Number four, I have Twitches 2 from 2007. Let's look at that IMDb. Oh, let me look at Halloween Town 2's IMDb first. Halloween Town's 2 IMDb, IMDb is a 6.3 out of 10 and a 62% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I would give Halloween Town 2 a 4 out of 5 stars. It's a really good movie, especially if it's aimed for kids and it's for Halloween. Very fun, very fresh. Just some shit they should have tweaked for it to be a 5 star, okay? Twitches 2. Twitches 2 got a 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. And a seventy per and a seventy percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but Rotten Tomatoes, eh. Twitches two was 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 not as good as Twitches one. I will say it was not as good as Twitches one, but it did have a lot of pros. I loved the climax of Twitches two because the whole movie we're building up, and Alex is like, I know Dad is one of the people who's in the shadows, and I know it's not Thanos. First of all. The is it dad or is it Thanto shit? Girl, that is T. Because they have this figure in the shadows and they either need to kill, and there's a figure they, they know they need to kill because it's it's terrorizing people. But then there's also a figure that they believe is their dad. And it's like, that is a very good conflict to have because it's an internal conflict and it's an external conflict. Someone is literally attacking people in Coventry and in the real world. And then it's also the conflict of, your dad is also in the same shadow realm that this person who's attacking people is, is in. And you have to be like, do I need to kill everything in the shadow realm or do I need to save my dad? It's like, honestly, a very good and layered conflict. And that conflict carries this movie for me. That's why this movie is at number four. I was thinking of putting it at number five. I thought about putting it lower. It was it was hard, but the conflict carries so much to me. This is probably my favorite conflict of any of any one of these movies, damn near. Hmm? Except maybe one of any one of these movies, damn near, because of be, because of that, because of what it does. I feel like the the impact that it has on the characters, Alex and Carmen, um, Cameron, sorry, Alex and Cameron is very interesting especially alex so i love that i love that it was involving the character development and they interwove the character development into the actual conflict and even cameron and alex had a tiffle about it because cameron's like isn't it more important for us to like literally save the world save coventry um especially if we're not certain that it's the dad and then alex is like no isn't it more important to make sure our dad is safe and we can meet him and he can come back to life if we know he exists and it's like it's so heavy. It's so heavy. It's so intense and it's so tea. And that carries the movie. Now, there are some cons. I felt like this was less fun than the first one because they already know they're witches. They could have did a lot more of them figuring out their powers. They tried to sprinkle it in, especially with Cameron, but they focused a lot on Alex and this boy at school. Them and their fucking love interest. Alex and this boy at school who was so irrelevant. He literally brought nothing to the movie. He never mattered. All it did was cause turmoil between Alex and Cameron. But it's like, that's not interesting turmoil for me. I don't care that Alex is talking to Cameron's ex-boyfriend, which is fucked up, by the way. Watch my Mean Girls video. You don't get with people's exes. But I just didn't care enough about it. And it wasn't going towards anything that I needed. I would have rather saw... Alex trying to figure more stuff out about her powers than, or practicing her powers than that. I do like that they still included Cameron practicing her powers. I like that they, didn't, they included Alex trying to figure out this mystery with her dad. Mystery is very important in these movies. I think it really increases the interest level of it. I feel like you should always try to combine genres. And when you combine genres is when a movie can really get to that top tier level of movie when it's like, okay, this is a drama and it's a family movie and it's a comedy, but now it's also a mystery. And that's where we got from, from this movie. We got so many different genres and I love that that mystery was involved and Alex is trying to figure out this mystery, but Cameron's trying to make sure she can save the world by perfecting her powers and learning this, learning this spell. I just wish we had a little bit more fun moments with magic. It's like, 
when I'm watching a movie and you're doing magic, I need it to be fun. I need you to have some fun, magical things that are happening for me to really stay entertained. I think Halloween Town does a really good jo- good job at that. And I think Twitch's one did a good job at that. But this one, it didn't really have that. I also didn't like that throughout the movie, there weren't a lot of, like, chase scenes. Like, the shadow, he got into a few people's bodies and was, like, watching them. But he wasn't attacking Alex and Cameron. And I wish we got attacks on Alex and Cameron like we did in the first movie with the darkness it was like literally chasing them and trying to grab them and you you know it was doing more active villainry in a more chase scene type of way and it causes action I wish there was more action in this movie because it was a lack of action it really was there wasn't a lot of oh ooh, ah, run you know and I, I wanted more of that so I, I, I that was one thing they could have added to it the the the, the Dimitri and Cam love story romance they had on the left, that was unnecessary as fuck. The Alex love story, that was unnecessary as fuck. Throw them love stories out. But other than that, and I feel like they could have used that time to have more fun, magical moments. And instead, they're showing us them with a boy who I don't give a fuck about. Like, mm-mm. So that was one of my cons, and that's why it's not in the top three. But baby, we're at the top three, girl. Oh, my God. So... This top three, I've twisted it around multiple times. Like I said, just to remind you, this is hard because I want to go based off of what is the best Halloween movie decom, right? That's what the title is. The issue is, I think to say that something is the best Halloween movie decom, you have to consider the impact of the movie. It can't just be the best movie on the list. That's why, oh, I would have rated Twitch's two a 3.5 out of five stars or a four out of five or a four out of five in between 3.5 and a four out of five stars. And that's the thing. There's movies like Twitch's two who are above other movies, even though I'm rating them less as a movie. Like, I don't think Twitch's two is always necessarily a better movie than every movie under it. And I feel like there's movies that are better movies than some movies that are above it. And it's because when I'm doing this ranking, it's not just about how good of a movie it is. It's about how good of a Disney Channel original movie it is. And to be a good Disney Channel original movie, it has to have an impact. It kind of has to have, you know, further... Things have to be affected by the creation of this movie, in my opinion. And I feel like that's kind of what I want to rate it on when I give this list, or else it wouldn't feel right. So that is why I gave the movie I'm about to say third space place even though i want to give it first so bad don't look under the bed 1999 is going to be my number three. Oh, how i love this movie this is like the best disney channel original movie ever fucking created this is just a good movie in general like every single element of this movie eats Let's get into the INDB. It's not going to do it justice. This should be a 10. 6.6 out of 10. This is like the second highest one I've heard, I will say. And it's 68% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's still pretty good. Y'all, if you haven't seen this movie, and I know a lot of people have not, watch this movie. Even as an adult, you can get into how good Don't Look Under the Bed is. This movie, 10, 10, 10s across the board, bitch. It's a mystery it's horror this there's like two of these movies that i've ranked that are considered horror and this is one of them and this is actually horror girl like it actually got me a little scared and gooped bitch it just has a lot of good elements into it so i think the stars of this movie are the stars of this movie i think the main character fran and the second main character larry they carry the movie their chemistry is out of this world. There's moments where they can joke with each other. It feels natural. There's moments where she's trying to ask for his attention and he's not giving to it. And it feels natural. It feels like two real people interacting in this situation. And I think they are the reason why this movie holds up so well. The acting is phenomenal and their chemistry is phenomenal throughout the entire movie to where they feel like two super believable characters. 
And that was one of my pros for Under Wraps, the 1997 version. These older movies are really killing it when it comes to the acting and the character development. And that is where they shined in this movie. I don't even want to spoil a lot in this movie because I want y'all to go watch it. So definitely go watch it. But the pros is definitely that. And the other pro is the concept. It's super unique. Like, I've never seen a movie with this concept before, where basically what's going on is the main character, Fran, has to figure out this mystery because a lot of strange things start happening in this town. And she finds out that there's this entity that is kind of messing with her and trying to frame her for all of the shit that's happening in the town. And it's like, damn. We have a framing, we have a mystery, we have this entity, like, girl, it's just so much going on. And as you go through the movie, they're unveiling the mystery. And bitch, I love a mystery, especially for a horror movie, especially for a decom. So they're unveiling the mystery and you learn more and more and more. And by the end, it's like this thing, is re- this big instance is revealed where it's like, oh my God one of the main characters is now switching into one of the main antagonists. And it's like, it's, it's a super interesting character development for the second main character in the movie, Larry and us watching it happen. is kind of like why it's so good. It's like, we're slowly seeing someone turn from a protagonist to an antagonist. And it just causes this very interesting element to the even the the eeriness of the movie it's like the movie starts off and it's like oh this is weird but you start feeling your skin crawl a little bit when you start seeing this main character turn into this other thing and you're like getting more and more afraid because it's like okay this was someone who was helping the main character and now they might be potentially someone who's hurting the main character and now who does she have to help her so it's like it's just really good it has so many good elements i feel like they reveal, they hint at the villain a few times at the beginning, and then they reveal the villain at the perfect time. And I feel like that's the very, that's the exact way a villain should be revealed, especially in a Disney movie. They should be hinted at. You should kind of see a a, a, a part of them, and then there should be a big reveal for what they actually are. And I feel like the way they gradually revealed the villain of this movie was so T, and they did it perfectly for sure. Now, another reason that this movie should be number one, and it's only not because they neglected it and stopped showing. This was the movie that they stopped showing on the network because it was considered too scary for audiences. And another element that I think probably impacted that was this movie, bitch, it was woke a little bit because this was the first movie on my on in order, when going in order from 1997 on, This was made in 1999, and it had a black main character. So there was a black main character on this movie from so long ago, and none of the other horror movies had a black main character until you got to literally 2021 with Under Wraps, I want to say. Oh, no, Twitches, 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 Twitches. So it wasn't until Twitches in 2005, which was 98, 90, when did this come out? This came out in 99. Six years later. It wasn't until six years later where we got a a main character who was black. And then even from Twitches on, it wasn't until Under Wraps 2. I mean, Under Wraps, the remake, where we got another black main character. So there's only been three black main characters in these horror franchises. And they've been spread out so far. But this was the very first instance of it. And they pushed boundaries on so many different things. And I really respect the director for this because I read in an article. So at the end of this movie... There is a kiss between the two main characters, which is a black man and a white woman. And Disney was like, maybe we should take that out. And the director pushed back and was like, no, it's a necessary element of the movie. I'm not going to spoil why it was necessary, but basically he felt like it was perfect for the plot of the movie and it worked well. And I agree that it worked well and it was perfect for it. And he pushed to include it. And he said, look, no matter how problematic quotations you might feel it is, I feel like it's necessary and we shouldn't be mad about it. And Disney was like, you know what? You're right. Let's just put it out. So shout out to Disney and shout out to them for that. And they put it out and there's a kiss on this movie between a black man and a white woman. And I feel like it's it pushed boundaries that at this moment, especially on Disney Channel, I didn't expect it to push. There's also this concept of gender gender expression and gender nonconformity. 
because it's not explicitly said, but there's a situation where it's like you think a character is a male masculine character, and then by the end of it, it's a female feminine character, and they kind of express i'm not I'm not just a man just because I seemed masculine and I seemed like a male, I'm just a person, and it's like, ah, that concept in nineteen ninety seven on a Disney Channel movie is so. T and this is one of the reasons why I liked zombies because zombies was touching on topics like segregation and this movie is touching on topics like equity and equality for the genders and for the races and I feel like stuff like that being included in these movies especially when especially when done well because I feel like there are times where it can seem forced or it can seem out of place or it can seem unnecessary and in these instances specifically zombies and in um, Don't Look Under the Bed. I feel like in these instances, it was ingratiated supernaturally. It just was, it was just the so happenstance that the main character was black and the other main character was white. He wasn't even, they weren't seeking out a black person to play the character. They just said they liked it that actor the most when he went and auditioned, so they included him. And I also love how when they included him, they allowed him to, express himself in a black way they didn't i don't know if they changed lines or they just allowed him to deliver the lines he wanted to but there were moments where he had black um like like aave african-american vernacular english where he was speaking in a way that was just comfortable for the black audience honestly he didn't he didn't change the way he delivered the lines and they didn't make him change the way he delivered the lines if a line was like like there was a line in the movie where he's like, girl, not you got a zit on your face. And they didn't make him change the way he delivered that. They let him say, girl, not you got a zit on your face. So it's like they really just allowed him to be black and express his lines in his full blackness on this movie in 1997. And it's like, oh, I have to appreciate it. This would be my number one movie if I wasn't considering the full impact of what the movies are having on Disney Channel as a whole. I really wish they allowed this movie to have a series. I wish they allowed this movie to still be played because I think it's important, the lessons that it it, it taught, especially in the era that it came out in. I know that they definitely still continue to play it, just not as much and not as often as stuff like Halloween Town. And I wish they still played it and there wasn't this backlash from the horror of it all because it's an amazing movie. 10 out of 10. I'm giving this movie five stars out of five. This movie honestly breaks my scale. For a Disney movie to be this good, it's actually insane. Y'all need to go watch it. 10 out of 10. I want to put it number one. It's number one in my heart and it's number one on any other type of list. But because of the impact, we have to move. Now, there's only two movies I haven't said. If you're a fan of DCOMs, you should know which one it is. So, my number two movie is going to be Twitches. Go Twitches. Go Twitches. It's all right thing. It's all right thing. Hey! Hey! Shout out to Tia and Tamara. Love Tia. Well, love Tia. Nah, I'm playing. Let me stop. Let, let me stop. Let me stop. Love Tia and Tamara, especially when they were young. This 17 again, I love 17 again. 17 again is one of my favorite fucking movies ever. God damn. The Tia Tamara version. I've never seen that Zac Efron shit y'all be talking about. Don't even talk to me about that. Tia Tamara version of 17 again. Watch that. That is a fucking hit. Okay? Now, Twitches got 60% on Rotten Tomatoes, 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. They don't know what the fuck they be talking about, girl. This, this is a 10 out of 10. This is a very great concept. Twin witches separated at birth have to find each other so they can defeat this darkness that killed their daddy when he saved them and gave him they, his powers. Bitch, what? Like, the concept is T alone. The concept alone is T. And I do genuinely think they executed it very well. They had to show us Alex's story from where she was adopted from. They had to show us Carmen's story. Cameron, damn it. Cameron's story from where she was adopted from kind of make it seem believable that their family and their lifestyle situations are believable and they ate it up. The acting for T from T and Tamara ate because I really felt like Cameron had this rich black family and I really felt like Alex was this poor girl who lived with her roommate, her best friend, and they executed it so well. And I love that they made them 
at such different levels of, you know, the socioeconomic divide. It's like they were including this socioeconomic concept in this movie. And I feel like that's important to how I feel about a movie. If they're talking about lessons that can be learned that are relatable. And I love when Disney does things that are relatable to society as a whole. And this was one of those things, them including that difference in you know, upbringing, especially because of money, was very interesting. And they always would talk about it when Alex was around Cameron. You could tell there was like a tension with the fact that Alex is poor and Cameron is rich. It's just simple as that. And it's like, it doesn't have to be stated so explicitly. And that's something they do in new age Disney movies. They kind of just state it. And it's like, you don't have to say it. You can just have it be. And we can feel the tension through it being just being. You know, and that's what we got in this movie. They just were in different worlds and now their worlds have to collide. And you could tell by their personalities how different their worlds were. And they really executed it very well. I think the pacing of this movie was was phenomenal. They found each other very fast. They found out each other were witches very fast, but not too fast. It's like we got time to understand them as individuals. We got to see them come together and then we got to see them together start to figure out that they were witches. We got time to see them enjoy coming into their powers. And we also got Ileana and Clark, who are hilarious. I love the comedy that they brought to the movie. And whenever you're bringing in side characters, it's hard to make the viewer, I feel like, like them. So you kind of have to have some special element to them. And Ileana and Clark had the comedy element. And it was similar to, like I said, with Girl vs. Monster with the parents. The reason I was so okay with us always going to see them is because every scene, they're being literally hilarious. And with Ileana and Clark, we get the story through them in a way. We see them separate the babies at birth. We see them um, help them re-meet each other. We see them kind of give us the urgency of the fact that we need to be hurrying up. They need to hurry up. And it was a way to give the reader the information that this was an urgent situation without just saying it. We could see Ileana and Clark talk about how they need to hurry up and get to it so we can not all die. And there was a it was a very effective way of telling the viewer the information and keeping the viewer involved without just explicitly saying it. Or sometimes they won't say it at all and we don't even know the urgency until the end of the movie and it's boring. So they really, they really killed it. They really killed it. They also took a risk in this movie. This is the only movie where the main characters are 21 years old. They are grown and they didn't give a damn. They're literally grown people. And the fact that it still worked is interesting because you would think on Disney, of course we want to see people our age, but they were grown. And even as a young a, a young kid, I knew they weren't young kids. I felt like they were, I thought they were older teenagers, but it's like, you know, they're grown. They're driving, but we're still able to enjoy the movie, even though they're grown. And I think that's something that Disney should da- not do all the time. It's definitely not necessary, but dabble into here and there because there are still things that can be entertaining, even if the characters are a little bit older, not freaking 30 year olds. But they're just 21 in this movie. And I feel like that works. And I feel like that's okay. And I feel like that gave something unique to this movie that I can't say about all the movies below it, other than Twitches 2, of course, is that they are older and they are grown people going through the situation and figuring it out. So I loved it all. There are really no cons. I I have no notes. Of course, there's always something movies can fix. But for this, there's nothing I can really think of because I enjoy it for what it is. The way they told the story, the way they had action scenes of the darkness following them. I loved that. The climax was really good at the end. Um, I love that. And I love how at the end, the way they defeated the darkness was them speaking out the people in their lives that they loved. Because I feel like the people we saw them with at the beginning, Alex's roommate and best friend, Cameron's family, we saw how even though they were adopted, they were still loved. Even the adopted part of it all. Adopted kids matter, bitch. Adopted kids matter. And I feel like they're even like having representation for people who are adopted and the fact that they can be loved and can be accepted. And even the fact that Alex is getting ingratiated so easily into Cameron's family, so welcomely, so lovingly, because she's her sister and they adopted Cameron and they love her so much. And I do love the concept of love and that that was how they were able to 
defeated. Because there's this scene where the darkness is chasing Cameron and the mom walks in and the darkness scurries away. And you're like, dang, why did it scurry away? The mom isn't magical. And then you find out it's because it's the love that the mom has for Cameron that saved her in that moment. And it's like, that's such a cute ass fucking, that's just a, that's just a cute ass concept. So loved it. 10 out of 10. I'm giving it five stars, of course. Last but not least, y'all. Halloween Town, the original. This movie gave me no choice but to put it at my number one spot. Every time I didn't want to, and I was like, don't look under the bed has to go first. Twitches has to go first. I, it gave me no choice because I'd watch Twitches and then the next movie on the list would be Halloween Town High that I got to watch. So I'm like, well, fuck, we're back at Halloween Town. So it's like every every turn you go within this Disney Channel movie, Halloween movie realm, you have to remember Halloween Town. So I just have no choice. The impact that it had was astronomical. It really, really was. Like, it caused a four-movie series. It inspired just, honestly, the concept of the Halloween era of how, of Disney when they would play all of these Halloween movies. I feel like it was sparked by Halloween Town. It really, really was. And I feel like this movie's impact, it transcends just Disney. And when you're looking up lists of movies to watch on Halloween, Halloween Town is always on there because of the impact it had on Halloween movies in general. If you want a movie that feels like Halloween, this is one of the top tier ones. It's weird because you would think there's hella movies that feel like Halloween. And there are a few, but they might get too much into horror. Other than the horror movies, it's like just a regular, fun, family-friendly Halloween movie. There's only a handful. Hocus Pocus and Halloween Town, and then some of the movies I've just named. And it's like, what else do we have, you know? And it's like, of course, there are more. Casper, there's there's um, Halloween specials, but there's only a handful. And Halloween Town is really one of the ones that, you know, grasp the essence of Halloween in multiple different facets. Because of this plot and how they had to go to Halloween Town and explore Halloween Town and get these elements to make this potion... It forces us to see all of the different elements of Halloween Town, which I love. We got to see ghosts doing their ghostly thing. And we saw that we got to see and we got to see Halloween characters doing interesting, normal things. And it made it interesting. You really usually only see ghosts doing ghostly things. Even Casper, it's like he's doing ghostly things. He's moving shit around, dropping shit. We got to see ghosts be in a sweatshop, be in a sweat box and just sweating. And get and going from fat to skinny as a ghost. And it's like, oh my God, that's hilarious. We got to see werewolves being hairdressers. That's hilarious. It's like the things they did with the exploration of the Halloween Town world and expanding on all of these well-known Halloween characters and making them fun and fresh. I really it, it it was it was honestly amazing. It really is a big impact. And I feel like that carried the movie. It's us seeing this world. And us seeing these creatures act in a different way than what we're used to. And I feel like that impact has lasted on Halloween movies from then on and to come. And it's just too much for me to not put it at one, number one, honestly. The conflict was cute. You know, they had to save the Halloween town because people were turning evil, literally, because of Calabar. I love that the villain had relationship with the mom. I love the struggle between the mom and the grandma. It really, it really was interesting how you could see the tug and pull of the mom and the grandma and the mom having such a bad history with Halloween Town and her having to come to terms with allowing her kids to do this thing that she feels like should be forbidden. But also it's like an identity crisis that we have to get into. We have to get into the fact that Sophie and Marnie know that this is their identity and they know this is what they should be doing, but their mom is wanting to keep it from them. And it's like, that's something that's very relatable to in real life, but they put it in this movie at the, as this intricate element and they had the grandma kind of be the antithesis of the mom in the sense of the grandma exudes Halloween and she exudes Halloween town and she exudes witchery. And the mom is just completely the opposite and she's bland and she's basic. And I feel like such it seems like such a, a easy detail to get done, but it's so easy 
And people would still miss it, I feel. People still wouldn't know to make the mom extremely this way and make the grandma extremely this way. And it would cause this big element to the movie that kind of creates layers. And they executed it and they executed it well. The only issue that I have, barely, is that it's very simple and very easy. But I feel like for a Disney movie, that's fine. And I don't want something that's too complex either. So I would rather them do something so simple. It still kept me interested. Um, Midway through the movie, the mom and the grandma both got stupefied by the main villain. We got a villain reveal at the beginning. At the beginning, we got introduced to the villain. And at the end, he revealed he was the villain. It was kind of like what I wish we had in number two, Calabar's Revenge. But I guess they probably felt like we just did that for number one. But bitch, do it again because it works. It works so well. The The villain was very interesting, Cal. And his motivation of wanting Halloween Town to be accepted in the real world because that was their world to begin with. We got lore for Halloween Town. We found out that Halloween Town was non existent. And it was just all of the Halloween creatures living in the real world normally and happily. And then the real world people started acting scared of them. And they started acting like they were different. And they pushed them out to Halloween Town. And it's like, uh, here y'all go. And it's like, these are still real world concepts that can still be applied to this movie. And I feel like we got everything we needed from this movie. We got lore. We got expansion. We got different elements of Halloween characters that we've never seen. We got a whole world of Halloween town that has that that gets explored. We got um, a push and pull from family dynamics with grandma and her and and mom, we got it from Marnie and her mom. We got it from so many different elements. So honestly, tens across the board. This is a this movie breaks my scale. It's five out of five. It really eats from beginning to end. And most importantly, the impact that it has on Disney is astronomical. The fact that it had four other movies after this, and I wouldn't be surprised if Halloween Town gets a reboot because, girl, it's a good movie. Just in general, like I said, everyone knows Halloween Town, so. Definitely tens across the board. I'm going to put it at number one. And that is my list, y'all. Number one to number 20, how I felt about every single Halloween Disney Channel original movie. I love Disney Channel. I grew up on Disney Channel. I had no choice but to do this video. If you listened with me throughout the entire time, let me know, I guess, in the comments on YouTube. Bitch, email me. I don't know. Let me know you <laughs> let me know your opinions on these Halloween decoms. Let me know if you've seen some. If you haven't seen one, go watch Don't Look Under the Bed. That's the one I'm recommending. And definitely just get into it. I loved this. This was a great Halloween season. Next Halloween, I definitely plan on doing even more. So definitely tune in with me for next Halloween. I love the holidays, holidays. So all of the holidays is gonna get tens from me. Okay. So definitely get into that. And thank you for keeping it real with the Ooh, wrong podcast, bitch. And thank you for tuning in with the scripted kingdom. We're out for now. Bye.